Okay, that call to order this September 21st, 2023 meeting of the Centerville Town Council. We'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. And if folks could remain standing for a moment of silence, I'd appreciate it. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. We have got a review of minutes from past meetings, August 17th, 2023, in our packets. Uh, is there a motion to accept those or any changes that need to be made? Motion to approve as presented. I'll second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? We've got a closed session statement. I'm going to read briefly. The town council met in closed session on Thursday, September 21st, 2023 at 6.30 p.m. at the Vincent Building, 110 Vincent Street, to consult with council in accordance with the Maryland Open Meetings Act. Five members of the town council voted to close the session. The authority to close the session is found in section 3-305 of the general provisions article. The town council discussed the following topics. Consult with council. We discussed potential litigation and related legal issues. The council took no actions. The following members and staff were present. Stephen K. Klein, President, Ashley H. Kaiser, Vice President, Eric B. Johnson, Daniel B. Wirth, and Jim A. Beecham members, Charles Chip Kugel, Town Manager, Carolyn Brinklin, Carolyn Brinkley, Town Clerk, sorry about that, Sharon Van Emberg, Town Attorney, and Lieutenant Andy Laramore. The meeting adjourned at 6.43 p.m. Can we pass that back around to Carolyn, please? Thank you very much. We'll now move into appearances, starting with the oath of office for Penny Lenz for the Board of Zoning Appeals. Penny, come on up. Who would like to, do you, you mind? Do you have a? We have it right here, sorry. I do not. Do we have a script? I got it. Oh, he's gonna come down to you. Thank you. I just need you to sign before, when you're done. I just need you to sign. Sharon tells me I have to. Pick <laughs> up some of this. Okay. All right. Please raise your right hand and uh, pronounce your name in full and repeat after me. I, Penny Linz. I, Penny Linz. Do solemnly affirm. Do solemnly affirm. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And that I will be faithful. And that I will be faithful. And bear true allegiance to the state of Maryland. And bear true allegiance to the state of Maryland. And support the Constitution and laws thereof. And support the Constitution and laws thereof. And that I will, to the best of my skill and judgment. And that I will, to the best of my skill and judgment. Diligent and faithfully. Diligent and faithfully. Without partiality or prejudice. Without partiality or prejudice. Execute the office. Execute the office. Of member of the Town of Centerville Board of Zoning Appeals. As member of the Town of Centerville Board of Zoning Appeals. Since you got that right, we're going to continue. <laughs> For a three-year term. For a three-year term. Expiring April 2026. E expiring April 2026. According to the Constitution and laws of this state. According to the Constitution and laws of this state. The town charter. The town charter. And laws and ordinances of the town of Centerville. And laws and ordinances of the town of Centerville. Wonderful. You are so appointed. Thank you for your service. You. Appreciate it. Thank you, Penny. You're <laughs> Our second appearance will be 152 Comet Drive, LLC. Green Thumb Industries, just ask that you please speak into the microphones. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Klein. Joseph Stevens, um, an attorney for um, Green Thumb Industries. My office is here in Centerville. 
uh, and I have with me um, Laura Brown, who is a principal, uh, as well as one of the founders of Green Thumb back in 2016. We're not going to take up a lot of your time, and I do appreciate the time ahead of the public hearing that you have this evening. Um, I'd just like to reiterate and explain a little bit more about what was in my letter to you on the 31st of August. Uh, Green Thumb Industries uh, uh, is sensitive and, and, uh, and concerned with the issues that have been raised. Um, they've spent a lot of time in the past few days um, and past few weeks, really, since this was introduced, start evaluating what they can do for an odor reduction system, uh, both uh, in several places. And Laura's going to go into a bit more detail on it. And I'm just going to talk 30,000 feet and what we'd like the council to do. Uh, the um, uh, evaluating where the odor is emanating from, uh, systems that can be used uh, both for the existing and for any potential expansion that they might do. But what we'd like the town council to do is step back from the ordinance um, and not adopt this ordinance which would prohibit Green Thumb Industries from growing on the property that they've purchased. Um, in regards to in regards to that, I, I think that it's important to realize, you know, what Green Thumb Industries has. And with that, I'm going to hand you, if I, if I could, a plat, which is this is just a sheet from their site plan that was approved by the Planning Commission about a year and a half ago, um, roughly a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago. And you can see this is Lot K that they purchased. Um, and you can see where they have existing grow, about 1.6 acres of existing grow. And you can also see the area that they've reserved for future development, and that would be future outdoor grow. Uh, this ordinance would prohibit them from doing that. You know, they've planned for that. That's part of what their business model is, and that's part of what the reason why they, they purchased $10 million worth of property, real estate, and improvements in the business park. Um, and so what we'd ask the council to do is to step back, give GTI time to um, come back to you with a program and an implementation uh, schedule, strategy, to implement some of the things Laura is going to talk about in regards to um, odor reduction. During that time, GTI will file no site plan request no approval to expand in that area that I showed you for future development, okay? It's a, so there's no bait and switch here. We've been talking to many of the people that have legitimate concerns from Symphony Village, um, and we've stressed that to them, and we hope that they'll support this idea um, with you this evening, because we see it as a win-win, okay? Right now, there's, there's th this ordinance, all that it does is it prevents GTI from expanding, and it prevents you know, additional agriculture in the business park. I'll let the owner of the business park speak to that issue. But um, uh, if, you, um, uh, if you give us the time, we can go back and look at, and we think we can come up, and Laura will explain, uh, significant odor reduction strategies for what's going on now. And then we're going to want to expand and implement their business plan if we're able to successfully do that. So that's essentially what we're asking for. And now I'll just turn it over to Laura. Thank you, Joe. Um, thank you to the town council. And thank you to the public here to listen tonight to hopefully, as Joe mentioned, come up with a win-win solution. We definitely want to let you know that we are here to listen to your concerns and hopefully um, we can come up with uh, a plan that satisfies everyone's needs. Um, just to remind everyone, back in 2016 was when my family, along with another family, uh, received a license to process mar uh, mar <coughs> medical marijuana from the state of Maryland, and we were so thrilled to come to uh, Centerville and the business park. Um, it was a business-friendly area in town, and we got the support of the town to be here. Uh, we were given the opportunity to lease from uh, Davis Emery, and we leased just about 6,500 square feet and uh, invested in that property. And in 2017, when we opened for operations, we were just about five people, and uh, we weren't sure how it was going to turn out. But fortunately, um, with an acquisition by Green Thumb 
and uh, a successful business and the support of the town, we were in a position in 2001 to actually not only buy out the whole uh, warehouse of 72,000 square feet, but also uh, some acreage in the back to do the outdoor cultivation. Now this was an important part of our uh, strategic business development plan. And so we did come to the town and the planning commission with a site development plan. And we talked through how this would work and we had permission to do that. So, um, and we were grateful for that. So we, and we've been doing that for last harvest and uh, we'll have a harvest this year. So this is pretty new to us and um, we realize that everything might not be perfect, but we're here today to say that we've heard the issues and um, now we are um, going back to see where we can fix any issues that are there, odor issues that um, we realize exist. What I have done is worked with um, our national team to bring in some of the experts. We have engineers nationally, we have uh, industrial hygienists, we have people on staff and experts we're bringing in from around uh, the country as well as bringing in new people from outside of our business. Uh, we have been on calls uh, we, um, several times a week since we've um, realized that this is a major issue. Um, and we are committed to finding a solution that works. And I think as Joe mentioned, what we wanna make sure is that we are not only um, addressing any future growth, which is what this ordinance is only about, but if we are able to um, come up with a time frame in order to address this problem, then we would also be committed to finding a solution for anything that exists today. And I think that's what's really important to us is that we need to really, I need to be able to go back to our executive team, our board, and be able to say that, look, they are allowing us to have time to come up with a solution. And, um, and here's what we've come up with. Here are the solutions. Um, and I'm happy to answer specifics. I don't want to bore you to death with the specifics about um, the scrubbers, the um, misters, things like that that we can do. Um, but I am happy to get into specifics if you would like. I've got a question right off the top. How long do you think it would take for you to come up with an actionable plan? We were thinking that, that we would do, it'd be two-step. Okay, if the, I know the council has to defer to a date specific if they were to defer the ordinance um, and action on the ordinance. And so we're looking at maybe five or six months deferral time, okay? Um, but we would come back in about 60 to 90 days and say, here's where we are. And during that 60, 90 days, Laura and I talked before we came in here, they would be implementing things, not just coming up with a plan, okay? They, they wouldn't implement everything, obviously, and seasonal issues are, you know, come into play. But during that 90, and we come back to you in 90 days, we let Symphony Village know when we were coming back. We'd have a dialogue with them, I'm sure. We've actually had a very good dialogue with them in the past 24 hours. Are you, can you, um, could yeah. you agree tonight to go to Symphony Village to go to their clubhouse and have a conversation? Is that something uh, you're willing to do? Yes, for sure. We okay. would, yeah. we would, um, yeah, we, that opportunity. We do that. We'd like to do it after we come up with an implementation sure, plan. Yeah, you know, yeah. and I don't want to say the same things we're saying tonight. Sure. Um, and so. one one thing to add to that is, um, as Joe mentioned, there were things, there are things that we can do, and we've already committed internally um, to reduce the amount of material that is going through one of our processes. These heated ovens that we do believe is one of our um, kind of worst offenders so to speak, in terms of uh, creating odors. And we've already come up with plans and are implementing those plans as we speak to reduce that amount of material. So I don't want people to think, oh, 60 days out is the first time we're gonna, they're gonna hear of any solutions. We are implementing those solutions, but as several people here I'm sure know from working in um, uh, the, the industry that drawing plans, engineering plans, drawing those things for to take to actually implement those structural plans, those do take time. So we are going to be working along the way, but to come up with a full plan, we would need that time. So many people work at GTI here in Centerville. Yeah, so we are just about 170 people today. Um, our payroll is over 500,000 per month. Um, so we and we offer benefits on every job the benefits kick in in the month following your first 30 days so and every job does have 
benefits. I don't know if I just repeated myself. Apologies. How many of those folks live in Centerville? Uh, I, I don't have that information okay. on hand, but uh, we can get that to you. I, I have a question. Oh, First of all, thank you for your presentation and taking the time to come in. Um, I've had an opportunity, I think, all of us to tour the facility, and clearly there's exciting work taking place. I'm going to get my microphone a little closer. Is that better, everybody? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so my question is, it just seems that with how things are moving very fast in this nation to allow for uh, recreational cannabis use, um, that with that comes late breaking sort of cutting edge technology to mitigate the odors and so my understanding is gti and as a founding member you would be able to speak to this you have several sites so are you guys on the cutting edge of that as far as the technology and 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 are you able to basically say that you know we've tried and trusted uh, tested some of these mitigation approaches at other facilities the community was able to react favorably because I think it's safe to assume, and then I'll finally let you have a chance to respond, that the community of folks that have expressed concern in writing and otherwise about the odor are interested in hearing what the strategies are, but I think probably are going to be more interested in hearing what is the efficacy of those and what can you kind of speak to. And you don't have to do all that tonight, of course, but you know, if you could touch on that, that would be helpful, I think. Yeah, um, I think, and just to point being on the cutting edge, we were the first facility in our fleet of facilities to implement some of the um, extraction methods that we're using and that we do think are contributing to the odor. So those are some of the reasons why we might not have some of the odor mitigation that we now believe should should be in place. So, But to your point, um, we have certain odor mitigation in other facilities. Um, and we will look at how effective those are, but we'll also look at other agricultural industries where we, those, where they do require odor mitigation by law, and look at the effectiveness of any sort of strategies and solutions that they implement yeah. to figure out um, what are the most effective, what are best practices. We can also look to other states and outside of our own. Um, solutions that we have at our facilities we're not that's why we're looking at experts and um, engineers outside of our own uh, kind of fleet of engineers that we have on staff one of the individuals heading that up was here last night with the planning commission okay. um, uh, jeremy Caputi. Kashuba. Uh, Kashuba. Um, and he's from the food industry. Okay. And he, 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 he was that control. He handled, he oversaw those, those types of control for mass food production and preparation um, factories, essentially, which he said is just is very challenging. So that's, that's the person. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here because of a family commitment this evening. Um, I, I would like to just make just, uh, the, just another point. I know that there's been discussion that, well, this ordinance is about prohibiting agricultural, outdoor agricultural in the business park. It's not about cannabis or odor or so on. And we know that it is about cannabis and odor. I mean, that's the issue. That's why all these people are here. Um, and that's why GTI is, 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 is going to go to such, such you know, lengths to, to address this. Um, but um, I, and I think that Davis Emery, who's here, can speak to it better. I, if this is deferred for six months, there's, there's not going to be somebody else dropping a cannabis growth request on the on the town and saying you know approve a site plan and we're going to go cannabis and you know at the prices that are justifiably generated in the business park for an acre of land you know and this five acres cost a million dollars that's on the land record so i'm not uh, so nobody's going to grow corn on this property except as a holding you know as mr davis does now to hold you know it's a holding property so w w we hope that you take all that in consideration and we very much would appreciate it if you defer and, and let us do this and let us come back to you the gti has a proven track record in the town issues have arisen in the past and they've come to the table and they've they've addressed them so you know they're gonna be here a long time so thank you Thank you for the answers. Thank you very much. Well, thank also, you. I have a question. Council yeah. President Klein, they're on the agenda like three times this evening. When would be the appropriate time for for us to be making comments? I, you know, I, mean, I'm, I have questions a bit, of, of our, you know. I think, you know, they're probably not going to come back up here again. This is the time for you to address them, so I would say now. Okay. Um, well, you already answered the question, how, many, how much time do you need to develop a plan? Will the plan include a schedule or just... 
and it think won't how de- schedule. Yeah, it should include a schedule. How detailed that schedule is will depend on factors of whether in, in terms of whether it's outside and a bunch of factors but will it definitely would include a schedule a time frame okay because it seems like you'd have to implement something by the springtime in order for it to be effective by harvest for the outdoor cultivation um do you expect to have something in place by then or, or otherwise we're just pretty much facing the same issue again this year so the harvest, um, unfortunately, is actually going to be in a few weeks. Um, but that's I'm talking about a, a year from now. I mean, oh, a year you know, from unless now. you, you know, implement some um, measures before then, we're not going to. You know. we, um, we currently do not have a. Well, we currently do not have a spring harvest at this point. Okay. So I think you misunderstanding my question. I'm uh, I mean, but you know, I, I, maybe <laughs> the question is, is the, what the council would like or Councilman Worth is asking, can we have a timeline and what will be done during that timeline? And the answer is yes, we'll provide you with a timeline and what, what implementation strategies will be done and when we could expect to have a result from what's being done. And then we can see how the result worked. You know, it's not, there's going to be some trial and error. And the other thing, too, is, is that I, neither uh, Laura Brown or myself see the, or GTI sees this as a six month and done. I mean, if if the count, if the, if we are able to proceed and they do expand, they're going to go to the planning commission, and we're going to be presenting to them the odor um, uh, reduction mitigation control plan as part of any site plan to expand. And we would anticipate that we'd be fu- that that would be fully part of any conditions of approval if we were if we are able to get there in the future. So, it, and then the, it, and implementation and whether or not there's going to be surety required or agreements written up, uh, that, that's too far down the line right now. Okay. Uh- does GTI have any other outdoor grow facilities that aren't in greenhouses in the country? We do have one other one. Where, where is that located? Illinois. Okay. Um, how many employees are involved with outdoor cultivation at this facility? Uh, I don't have that exact number. Okay. What about cultivation in general? Uh, I can get back to you on that. I, okay. Because we do have people who... We are, everyone is badged for both, right. so people do cross over. They're, most people are, are specialized, um, but Right, because your, your job description is going to be specialized as cultivators or they're working in the, in the lab, lab area or, right? Are you, where is it? Just got to speak, speak no microphone. For sure. Speak up and identify yourself if you would, Phil. Hey, uh, good evening, everyone. I'm uh, Phil Huff. I'm the head grower at Green Thumb. Um, so... Which which question do we want to start with? How many uh, employees in the outdoor grow? Yes, let's start with that. Um, we have currently 20 uh, employees in the outdoor grow in preparation for the harvest. Uh, generally, this staff is closer to seven, eight. Um, and then total for cultivation, counting, like post-harvest and everything, as far as up through uh, when we break down plants and, and initially trim them, is about 68 employees right now. Okay. Thank you. And we're, and we're currently at 200 total, uh, just under 200 total for the site as right. well. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Mr. Steve, how would you envision this if we, if we come up with an agreement? I guess I don't understand how it would be enforced. It would just be a handshake. Is it written letter? Or is it like. You mean the agreement not to submit a okay. site plan to, to expand so it? No, I mean, as far as you got, you promised not to. Go to the planning commission and expand. Um, right. We have no requirement that you have to provide a um, odor mitigation plan for. No. no, we do not. No, you don't. But if right. we're here in six <laughs> months and you're right, you have this on the agenda for adoption, and we haven't, and we haven't done anything, including we haven't submitted a site plan to expand because I'm representing that to you here this evening, and so is Ms. Brown. Um, then um, uh, you act on the ordinance, and we're we can't expand. <laughs> And that's a very compelling reason for us to do it. That's why I'm here. That's why they've done all this. So. So um, I may have to repeat myself later on this, but I am a champion of economic development in Centerville. And I think Davis Emery in the back of the room will advocate to that because we worked together to create the Economic Development Authority. And he was on our founding board for that. I have toured your facility years ago, the processing facility. I'm very proud to have you all as a member of the Centerville business community. Yeah. The, um, the odor issue, and I don't 
use that word with any judgment. Just it, it, it is an odor, and um, you know what we do, what we do with it has been a fast moving issue. Mr. Stevens and I have had a couple of phone calls about this um, this week about this. The ordinance it isn't going to solve the problem. The ordinance is um, would just be a holding pattern to ensure that it doesn't get any worse. And I don't mean to imply just you, but any other entity that may come in in the meantime, in the six month interval that Mr. Stevens is suggesting. So, you know, there has to be some, some good faith both ways, I think. Uh, I'm not saying we're gonna pass it, but I'm just saying it could be construed as a holding pattern. And anybody that's here to talk about the other issue in a negative frame, I think you would all recognize that the status quo going forward is not acceptable. What we'd like to have is the mitigation that GTI is offering to pursue. Continuing where we are is not really a solution for us. Um, and all this ordinance does is says that it's not gonna, the odor issue may not increase. So the ordinance really isn't the solution that we, that we need. I personally, I would perceive it as sort of a zoning moratorium, if nothing, you know, for lack of a better word. Um, should we be able to proceed, uh, you know, and should the ordinance go into force, I think it should be well communicated to you that the ordinance can be amended and revised at any time based on what happens in the future. So um, I'm not sure how we will proceed. I know we're all um, concerned about this. I don't think anybody's made up their mind about how to proceed, but I just wanted to clearly say that should the ordinance pass, please understand it's because of a concern to have a holding pattern and it's not the Rosetta Stone of law. We can revise it later and I think there are folks already working on revisions to the language that may modify it, if it passes, modify it subsequently that would address air quality issues and not the prohibition. So. I'm, I'm glad that we have um, a willingness on both sides to work through this, and I'm begging you not to misconstrue what we may or may not do with the proposed ordinance, because I think everybody recognizes, both in the audience and on this dais, that that ordinance doesn't solve the problem that we're all concerned about. Well, I have a question, if you don't mind. Sure. For, for practical purposes, if another large agricultural user showed up and wanted to buy a bunch of land from Mr. Emery and put something, doesn't our lack of allocation sort of cre <laughs> create the moratorium some way? Be, I mean, it, do we have the water for another massive agricultural use in the town? No, not, not with the kind of water they go through. And, and particularly, I think, with this ordinance on the table, I don't think if anybody in the cannabis industry were to try and put that kind of infrastructure in place with the reverse osmosis systems and all that they have in there, that's a significant outlay of, of funds that absent absent the allocations, nobody else is coming. Okay. Yeah. And and I, I think it's important that I that that, that I, I be clear and, and we've had this discussion internally, um, is that that we're offering a moratorium by saying we won't come in and do that. I've represented that here. That's not gonna change. Um, and um, uh, and so if the ordinance is adopted, then GTI bylaw cannot expand. So it's gonna make it difficult to go to the publicly traded company and their board of directors and say that we need to implement all these techniques at hundreds of thousands of dollars. And that's what we're doing, maybe more than hundreds of thousands. And by the way, you know, maybe the town will change the code at some future time. Um, and also, because this is an important point, Let's do an engineered site plan for that expansion so that we can present that, because that's gonna have conditions about odor mitigation and, and so on, and present it, but we can't do it. You know, it, it, it's, it's, I think that in candor, it's, 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 uh, it's a little difficult to swallow for the company. Um, and then there's no harm to any expansion. There is no additional odor that's gonna happen as a result of what we're proposing. So we'd like you to seriously consider it because we're just not sure what, you know, if it passes, we haven't had that discussion about how things proceed. 
I, I do have one follow-up question. Again, thank you. Um, when I took the tour of your facility, one of the things that I was particularly impressed with was one of the PhDs or two on site that deal with innovation and just learning some of what you produce and, you know, full disclosure, I'm a, a combat veteran with PTSD. I, I personally don't use cannabis, but I have a lot of veteran friends that do and do very well with it. So I am definitely not somebody sitting up here in judgment of the industry or the great work that you do. So in being particularly impressed by that, it, it has occurred to me, and I think it would be helpful if in the mitigation steps that you outline, that you carve out a portion of that to just speak to, to the extent that some of the innovation efforts have led to distinct odors that may not be part and parcel to what a typical run of the mill outdoor growth facility might generate. I think that's particularly important. So not suggesting that that's you know, where it's coming from, that kind of thing. But because that is something that I think set you all apart as unique, when we toured the facility, I, I think that would be helpful. Various strands, things of that nature that might yes. generate a different odor. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you so much, and thank you for your service. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to move into two public hearings. Uh, we're going to start with... Ordinance 05 2023 Indoor Agriculture. I've got to find a piece of paper. Bear with me one second. The subject of this hearing is Ordinance 5 2023, an ordinance of the Town Council of Centerville amending the Town of Centerville Zoning Ordinance, which is Chapter 170 of the Town Code to only allow indoor agriculture as a permitted use in the planned business district or PBD. I will now call on Council Member Worth to provide background on Ordinance 5-2023. Uh, this ordinance um, is basically an attempt to turn the clock back to where um, agriculture is not allowed in the business park. That, that was a, a recent ordinance change that occurred um, in two, 2001. Um, However, recognizing 21, 21, 2021, right? Okay, thank you. Um, recognizing that there's an existing facility there that has um, outdoor grow and indoor uh, growing of um, cannabis, um, we um, it would allow that to con continue, but not to be expanded. Um, and I also should note that the um, planning commission gave this uh, unfavorable recommendation. The council has the, a record of that uh, decision in their packet. That was a uh, four to day, four to one unfavorable recommendation from uh, Kara Willis, the chair of the planning commission. Uh, I will now call Carolyn Brinkley, town clerk, to present evidence of the published notice of this hearing. Certificate of pub. Certificate of Publication, State of Maryland, County of Queen Anne's, this is to certify that the Annex Legal Advertisement has been published in the September 1st, 2023 Bay Times Record Observer. Thank you. We will first hear from all those in favor of Proposed Ordinance 5-2023, and then we will hear from those who are opposed. Please keep all comments to three minutes. You are welcome to provide written testimony to the Council as well. Uh, Carolyn, would you like to read the public comment guidelines? Welcome to this meeting of the Centerville Town Council. This is a public meeting and we welcome your participation. By attending, you acknowledge that this session is recorded and aired on QAC TV 7. During the meeting, we ask that you turn your cell phones off and hold personal conversations outside the meeting room. The scheduled agenda is available on the information table just outside. Public comment will be limited to three minutes per person. The Town Council respects and appreciates your desire and right to convey your message freely. And in keeping with the dignity of proceedings, we ask that all views be expressed in a respectful and civil manner. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. If questions are a part of your comments, we will refer those to the appropriate individual. Thank you. Before we get started, we are going to abide by a, a strict three-minute limitation uh, tonight because of the number of folks in the room. So Carolyn will have a timer set up. When you hear that timer go off, it's time to wrap it up. Thank you for cooperating in advance. We will now hear from all those in favor of proposed ordinance 5-2023. Uh, 
some folks signed up here for public comment. Uh, I think just come on up. If you're for the amendment and, or for the ordinance and you want to speak to it, uh, come on up. All those in favor? <laughs> That's okay. You were ready. <laughs> we can uh, just, and folks can line up behind folks if you just want to come to this middle uh, microphone. Just uh, tell us who you are and, and where you're from. Good evening, uh, members of council. My name is David Mitchell. I am from Centerville. I live in Sympathy Village. I'm here to speak in favor of the ordinance, and I've heard rhetoric that, well, this is a, um, a stopgap, it's a moratorium. I'll take a moratorium. My eyes are burning now because of the smell of cannabis in this room. I live over on Encore Court, and along with my neighbors, we have a right to quiet title, it's called, as an attorney. And if you look it up, you'll see that I have a right to enjoy my property without a common nuisance interfering with that right. This is a common nuisance. This is not good behavior. I'm not anti-cannabis. I'm anti-businesses that turn into common nuisances. Insofar as, I, I, I just can't help but think that hearing from representatives of GTI, um, Maybe, maybe you didn't incorporate this into your business plan. I don't know. You're acting like you're surprised now that, well, we're going to have expenses. Well, I, if you look up how much money is being made on cannabis, I don't think the issue of uh, capital is, is, is a real big concern. There's a coalition in California that's brought a class action suit, a coalition for responsible cannabis. And it's on this subject, period. As an attorney, I will not hesitate to pursue that. And people may giggle and they may think that's funny. I don't. I'm going to stand up for my property rights and the rights of everyone living in my neighborhood. I heard the mention of veterans. There are a lot of veterans living there. And they don't go out and walk at night. Why? Because of the odor. Again, I'm not anti-cannabis. I'm anti-common nuisance, and that is what GTI is right now. So I advocate for the passage of the ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So you speak now if you're supporting the ordinance? Yes. I have cows. I was working on the farm today. You know what I did before I got here? Took off my muck boots, changed my clothes. You know why? Because they smelled like cows. It's common decency. It's what you do. I heard comments made about we're sensitive and concerned. We're going to have a win-win situation. Are you people serious that you had no idea of the accompanying odor that would occur with your facility? Now, we use phrases like, well, may not be perfect, but now we're working on it to fix it. And we need some time to come up with a solution. You know, when I started farming about 45 years ago, I knew what my cows would do, what my sheep would do, they would take this wonderful smelling sweet feed and lovely alfalfa hay and orchard grass, and they would turn it into something that didn't have quite as a pleasant odor as originated. And you know something? I had a plan. I had a plan. Just a simple little 20-year-old, 25-year-old had a plan. Compost that, till it in, reuse it, you can walk around my farm, you can walk around where those cows are, and you can walk around 20 feet outside the fence and you're not going to smell it. You know, unless a couple of them lay a nice fresh pile right next to the fence and the wind's blowing just right, you know what? You guys lay a nice pile and the wind blows just right. And it blows towards my house. 
Guess what I don't get to do? I don't get to open my windows and enjoy the breeze. Now, once again, I guess we're supposed to clarify that we're not against reefer. Whoops. Um, well, I probably smoked it before two-thirds of you were born. Um, I don't mess with my head now, and it's up to anybody else what they want to do with it. I think it's just fine. As a former bouncer, I'd rather never remember having to escort somebody out that had too much to smoke, but I certainly did when they had too much to drink. But to act like, oh, this is a surprise to us. Oh, we need to mitigate it. But you want to grow. It seems to me that the time to think about that was before this happened. I've had guests come to my home. They go, geez, you got a bunch of skunks in this town, don't you? I said, well, not exactly. Um, and it does have, it does resemble that odor. I think I should be able to open the windows of my house. I think I should be able to enjoy that. Of course, I also think I should be able to enjoy a glass of wine and a good cigar on my front porch. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Bring my car up here. He's a tough act to follow. I, I can't. Comedy. <laughs> Good evening, Pat Fox, uh, Symphony Village. As you know, the Planning Commission voted to not approve the proposed changes to Ordinance 05-2023. I voted in favor to support my Symphony Village community and our nearly 330 petition signers, as well as many we received from Northbrook. But I added during the meeting discussion um, that we needed more steps and council approvals to eliminate odor that the, the, um, the ordinance was not uh, sufficient on all counts. Eliminate odors which are detrimental to the welfare of town residents and businesses, and in order to have a desirable business park for companies to want to move into and make an investment. There was also group discussion about GTI working with the town to develop a solution to protect the interest of the residents and existing businesses and GTI's interest as well. So I went home and I added further language to the draft ordinance, which currently would only allow uh, the indoor agriculture. So my new language starts after this statement. Um, indoor means within an enclosed building with a controlled environment. My new language is controlled environment which is governed by an air quality program developed by a qualified engineer and approved by the Centerville Town Council, which will assure elimination of any odor emanating from the building or buildings during the growing or processing of the cannabis. This will require installation of state-of-the-art industrial air scrubbers and filters. Regular quality control inspections must be conducted by a qualified engineer. Any complaints about noxious odors will be investigated by the town and could or would force temporary closure or cessation of activities until the problem is rectified. To meet the air quality program requirements existing, the existing outdoor growing should be moved into an equally equipped structure by the next growing season in 2024, or whatever growing season comes first, or next. Um, an interesting um, code from Hackettstown, New Jersey, states that cannabis cultivation and manufacturing operations shall utilize available technology to filter and recirculate air so that odors are not discernible by, any, by a reasonable person beyond the property line. Think about what that says. That's interesting. And we know that uh, GTI is in a number of communities, and many of them have enacted odor control laws. Um, and again, um, in agreement with others who have stated economic development is a huge principle for those 45 acres that are called a planned business park. And we don't want to dissuade businesses from moving in because of an odor issue. Imagine a restaurant that might want to have outdoor dining. OK, thank you, Council. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Speak into the mic. They know I have a weak voice. Hi, I'm Robert Eves. Thank you for this opportunity. 
And good evening. I'm a resident of Symphony Village. Uh, the state of Maryland has opened the door to growth of cannabis and the sale of cannabis byproducts. However, minimal guidance and regulations have been provided by the state to small rural communities where most of this growth takes place. There's no playbook for how all of this is to be implemented while not harming the quality of life of our town and residents. Paramount also is the integrity of the ecological environment of the Chesapeake Bay. The City Council has been handed a growth industry without being given a playbook while it weighs the requirement, the required need to increase revenue in order to upgrade the town. As cannabis operations proliferate, state and local governments are promulgating regulations and ordinances that directly regulate cannabis emissions. Cities in California, Colorado, Illinois, Oregon, and Pennsylvania have all used general nuisance regulations specifically targeting cannabis operations. For example, regulations in Long Beach, California state that odor filtration must prevent odors from inside the cannabis facility from being detected outside of the facility. Other cities have implemented similar requirements. Other environmental problems associated with cannabis operations are wastewater and stormwater discharges. Wastewater discharge from indoor operations are generally considered industrial waste and are subject to local, local, state, and federal regulations. Typically, wastewater is discharged into a publicly owned treatment plant, which must be approved and possibly permitted. Oftentimes, this industrial waste must be treated first before it is discharged into a treatment plant. Discharging directly to the ground or surface may trigger different permitting requirements. Discharging onto land that infiltrates down to groundwater are generally regulated by state groundwater discharge programs. The Federal Clean Water Act regulates pollutants into waters of the United States. Specific permits are required and enforced by the states. The Federal Clean Water Act also regulates stormwater discharges. The discharge can include runoff from cultivation that may contain fertilizers and pesticides, both of which are needed for cannabis growth. A site-specific discharge permit is required unless there are industrial storage tanks used for discharged wastewater. The GTI growing facility is in close proximity to the Mill Stream branch of the Corsica River, which flows into the Chesapeake Bay. For 57 years, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation has overseen an attempted reclamation of the bay while promoting regulations to protect her water quality, the health of the oyster industry, etc. Let me just say, many issues need to be resolved. Many regulations need to be initiated and enforced. For such Sorry. a small community, these are large and consequential tasks. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. Good evening, council members. My name is Julie Seymour. I'm a resident of Symphony Village. I'm also a realtor and I'm licensed in Maryland and Delaware. We moved from Delaware to Symphony Village three years ago. Had I known that there was a marijuana growing facility behind my neighborhood, we would not have bought the home. The noxious odor from the growing facility impedes our enjoyment of outdoor activities. This week we had gorgeous fall weather. I can't even open my back door. Recently, I was getting my granddaughter ready for school. They live in Northbrook. I mentioned to her, do you ever smell that skunk smell when you're at Kennard Elementary? She right away looked at me and said, well, it's really bad at recess. I mean, she didn't know what that was. Um, the smell's really bad and uh, exposing our children is not acceptable. Additionally, I've spoken to many of the businesses around GTI's Comet Drive location. Not one of them knew about the possibility of further expansion. One of them, Project Chesapeake, is a substance abuse counseling program. They've had ongoing issues with the odor coming into the vents of their business, which triggers their patients. 
The people at hospice had no idea. They just saw the building happening and then they had the odor. Green Thumb Industries has stated that they want to be a good neighbor. They must communicate with the neighboring businesses as many of them don't reside in town or regularly visit the town website. As far as odor mitigation strategies, I have two articles, one of which appeared in a June 2022 issue of Environmental Health Perspectives. Odor control in the cannabis industry stating the burnt of bad odors is frequently borne by the low income communities already struggling with other exposure and health disparities. I would hope Symphony Village is not to be considered low income housing. The article went on to state that the largest grows are predominantly outdoors or in greenhouses, allowing for easy escape of nuisance odors. When conditions are right, the scents can carry far, and some individuals appear to be acutely sensitive to them, even in passing. The second article, Odor Mitigation Strategies for Cannabis Grows, June 2021, stated in part, Left unaddressed, cannabis odor is arguably the single biggest risk to commercial cannabis operations due to the potential for litigation and regulatory enforcement action. As facilities scale, so does the issue of the real and perceived smell. The number one issue is that human olfactory perceptions are subjective, meaning that our individual responses to the same odor causing emissions can vary significantly. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Thomas Seymour. I'm a resident of Symphony Village. Uh, I've been in the uh, plant, commercial industrial HVAC and plumbing industry for over 45 years, and uh, I'm in favor of mitigation. Uh, the odor issue is not a new problem. That problem's been around for decades and there's equipment out there available to mitigate this odor issue. If GTI is committed to providing an odor mitigation plan, I suggest it be designed by a licensed professional engineer. It shouldn't be done by a hygienist, it should be done by a licensed engineer. The plan should include carbon absorption filtration for the indoor growing processing exhaust systems, as well as fog systems to mitigate the odor emitted on their outdoor growing. These systems are becoming, if not already, standards of the industry for commercial cannabis grows and processing facilities. There should be a review of the final design for approval by the Planning Commission and Town Council. Upon approval, these systems should be installed for plans and specifications. When the installations are completed, there should be an inspection for compliance and final approval made by an independent source familiar with the design. The system shall be maintained and determined by the design engineer and inspected periodically to assure the systems are properly maintained. And I would say time frame wise, I have experience in developing schedules. I would say 120 days is more than enough time to develop a plan, uh, one that could be then be implemented and the systems be in operation prior to the next grow year. I thank you for your time. Thank you. My name is Mike Goldsmith. I live in Northbrook. I don't live in the um, over 55 community. Um, the only thing that I think I have to say is the fact that my kids dance at the factory at the facility that's by the factory. Their dance studio smells like marijuana. The outside parking lot smells like marijuana. Marijuana is not the issue. Anybody here that wants to argue that it's the issue is not the issue. It's just the fact of the environmental factors. Also, the gentleman right here in the suit said he wanted to be a their company to become a PTO, a publicly trading company. What does that mean? That now means they're going to share it to shareholders. At that point, their entire business is about just making money, okay? For all the employees that want to come up here and argue against this, you guys should unionize because at some point, if it becomes a PTO, you're going to lose your rights too. It is, it is publicly traded already. Th there you go. So at this point, you got a bunch of worker bees that don't live in our town that are going to come up here and argue against this. 
My only factor is I get up at 4.30 in the morning to go to work. It smells like skunk. I come home 8 o'clock the next morning. It still smells like skunk. My kids have to live with this. My wife has to live with this. My friends have to live with this. Nobody cares about the fact that we're going marijuana. It's bringing business to our community. But please, we're just asking to make sure it's regulated for the odors. Thank you. At Good Muth, and I'm with Symphony Village, and um, I have a question for Green Thumb. Um, the I know you're working on a process for the processing and to eliminate the odors, but how about when the the plant? I've never smoked, so this is really hard for me. I feel like I'm on a high. But anyway, um, how about when the plants bloom? Don't they let go of that odor as well? How are you going to contain that in a processing plant if it's out in those fields and you're doing tons and tons of fields? I, I don't understand how that's going to work. The chair, I'm, I'm defer to the chair as to whether you want to. Uh, we don't want. I don't think we have to have engagement like this. I think that w I think we will. We will ask that question of the count. We can't have this sort of debate uh, between the folks that are in the room here. I mean. Uh, we can get an answer about for that. marijuana fields, aren't we? I mean, I just want to know, do they we, create that odor as well as the product? You guys feel like plant? prepared to answer that question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speak up into the thing so we can um, hear you. Apologies. <laughs> So thank you for the question, and um, that is one of the things that is more difficult, and that is why we would like the time to come up with an appropriate solution. Um, but that is one of the newer technologies that people, well, newer to us, that we are finding that we might be able to come up with bigger, with windbreaks, with um, fans and misters and things that would hopefully we think be efficacious in this scenario. But again, we need more time to research what are best practices in this industry, in other agricultural industries that do create odors. Um, in industries, um, as Joe mentioned, one of our uh, vice presidents, of, or our vice president of operations comes from an industry where they baked onions and pro processed onions, which obviously created a huge odor and they had um, ways of mitigating that smell. So, but was, it was, was it the odor coming from the fields of the onion fields, or was it the processing? No, but there, the you're, you're correct. So there, um, those were inside, but there are other um, places where there are fans that emit odors that are, and then miss those odors that go through the fans are misted, and that does then. Uh, has the odor sink to the ground, so they don't, they're not emitted into the air. So those are types of things that we're looking into. How many additional fields are you going to grow? There's no plan for expansion at the moment, and I think we've, we do have to limit folks to three minutes. I didn't hear my bell go off. Uh, I think it's been. Yeah, 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> 10 seconds. This is deja vu, deja vu for me. I can't even talk. I'm so high. Um, the. Uh, more, when we moved in 20 years ago, we had a moratorium, and I can't go on to tell you about it, but thank you. I'll tell you later. <laughs> uh, Mr. President, if I could just quickly state, I, I think, Ms. Uh, Goodmuth, the, the question you raised is a good one, and, and I'm seeing nods and, and what appears to be interest in the time you took to answer the question. So I think you could safely assume that that will be covered in the mitigation approach that they uh, put forth. My, I'm seeing nods in the in the affirmative. Anybody else in favor of the ordinance? All right, we'll move to those opposing proposed ordinance five dash twenty twenty three. Again, a three minute cap on comments. Come on up if you are opposing ordinance five dash twenty twenty three. Good evening. Thank you for your time. 
Uh, my name is Michael Armstrong. I am the supply chain manager and logistics manager on site at GTI Centerville. I've been an employee with the company for uh, coming up on six years uh, this November. So I have been around at the facility since almost day one, working side by side with uh, Laura Brown um, from when the facility was uh, Chesapeake Alternatives, partnering with GTI. Um, I am not a resident of Centerville, um, but I have spent a considerable amount of time, as you might imagine, um, in a leadership role on site. Um, I've spent many hours in town after hours, um, you know, um, uh, attending restaurants, bars in town, um, spending a lot of time with, um, with the citizens of this town. Uh, I do want to say I appreciate um, having the opportunity to hear the viewpoints of the residents of Symphony Village. Um, obviously, as uh, an employee there, we do get numb to that smell, um, but I want to say that I have seen GTI and um, this site here in Maryland um, truly show that we, we do want to be a part of this town. We are the biggest employer in the area and want to continue to um, grow our relationship with the town. I'm proud of the work that we've done so far and um, and I am confident that um, we, we are going to be able to find a way to, to come to um, uh, a compromise here or, or a solution that works well for everyone. Um, I, I'm very encouraged by some of the comments comments um, from the Symphony Village residents um, and, and their open-mindedness to um, technology that is already out there from other industries. Um, and, and I'm hoping that um, we can move forward to a, a common solution there. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jeff Mangold. Uh, thank you to council members for hearing us today and, and letting us speak up here. I'm the sales director for Green Thumb. Um, I've been working with the company since 2018, been in, in Centerville. Um, we, um, you know, at the core- You might want to get a little closer to the I'm microphone. Sorry, sorry, sorry right. there, there you go. Um, one of the things that has attracted me and, and kept me at this company for so long is uh, the core values that this company has. Um, we have what's called HHGTI, and that's um, hardworking, humble, grateful, transparency, and integrity. And from the top down, uh, that's, that's our philosophy, and that's what drives us, uh, partnership, collaboration, um, in, in everything that we do. Um, we are a partner here in Centerville. Um, I, I spend a lot of time, as Michael was saying before, uh, who just spoke before me, with the businesses. Um, I have to uh, entertain a lot of, of people that, that come in there, large uh, groups of people, um, and, and we are, are active in, in the community uh, um, and, and uh, very much want to be a part of this. And, and the plans that, that Laura and, and the leadership is, is discussing and, and the moratorium that we'd like to have in this uh, 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 regulation that is looking to pass um, give us the time that we need like my, my companies always stand behind their word they've always done that and in every community that we've go in it, it's a partnership and can't stress that enough and that's what's kept me there and it's just been great to be a part of a company that is so committed to that in, in everything that we do um, so uh, definitely uh, I'm against this and I'd like the the council to, to also see it that way as well thank you thank you Good evening. <clears throat> Why do I feel like I'm always the last to know? I'm the single largest property holder in, the, in this zoning district, and I only found out about this Tuesday night. I, is there no communication between the citizenry and, and the town? And I mean, the zoning clearly states that if any use in, in the park creates a nuisance and odor and such, I mean, that's a violation of the zoning. I have CCRs in my park that say the same thing. So I'm a little perplexed as to why it got to this. I mean, I'm not trying to make enemies and disturb the neighborhood and be a bad guy. I'm trying to develop a business park here. So there was some something missed here. I, I, I'm a little perplexed by that, but that's irregardless of this. I, Confident that GTI, being a publicly traded company, will do the right thing. 
I mean, they've been nothing but honest and open throughout this whole process. This, this is a whole new industry, folks. I mean, they're discovering things all the time. And I gotta believe that they're gonna come up with a solution here. They might, they might you know, patent a new solution. You just don't know. Now, I'm sorry for the, the disturbance, I get it. I live in Southern Chester County, Pennsylvania. That's mushroom country. Do you know what that smells like? <laughs> Whew. I mean, some days, it, your eyes burn. I mean, it's, it's that bad. I mean, but irregardless, I don't see how this, this doesn't solve the problem in the short term. So I think it's a waste of time right now. They're, you've got our attention. They're gonna find a solution. I'm convinced of that. So uh, I would ask you all to stand down, table this, uh, they're going to work on it. They're going to come up with a solution because they want to stay here and they want to thrive here. And they're not in the business of, you know, hacking everybody off and being a nuisance. I mean, that's just not what, what they're here for. So I would ask for everybody's patience. I, I, I feel, re you know, just uh, flabbergasted that I felt like I was the last to know about this. I'm trying to bring new businesses into the park. I know Royal Farms wasn't a favorite, but I'm trying to you know, bring good and useful uh, retail, uh, employment, you know, live here, work here. Um, to Joe's point, I've, I've been approached by some other growers, but you know, they said, I, I said, why would you want to buy you know, uh, commercially zoned land you know, to, to grow, to do agriculture? It doesn't make any sense, public growing. And that's why you see most of the growers are out in counties and out in, out in the boonies for the most part. But um, I, I would hope that uh, give them a chance. They're just getting started on this, and I know they're gonna come up with some good solutions here and try to mitigate this, this problem. Because as I said, they wanna stay here and they wanna grow here. So I uh, thank you for that consideration, and thank you for the time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Dominic uh, Rizzuto. Uh, they didn't want to run up here again. Um, uh, yeah, so I work at Green Thumb. Um, I'm not a Centerville resident. Um, I spend a lot of time here. Most of my friends live here. I mean, like regularly golf with like a Centerville cop. Like, it's um, it's. I spend a lot of time out here, and um, it's. I don't know. Uh, I like the company and like it's my first job with benefits my first real job you know I've done like construction before this and they they're they they're good so far you know um, and like the the codes that we have and like everything that like we sort of stick to I like the company is like pretty serious and the outdoor like I stayed for over time and it's and uh, everything seems very good, I guess. Um, yeah, so, sorry. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dominic. Really appreciate everyone's time here tonight. Thank you so much, all, for, for coming out. Um, my name's Phil Huff. I've been with the company for just under four years now. Uh, really have been welcomed in by this community after, I've, I'm obviously not a Centerville resident. I, I relocated for this job. I moved across the country and have found this place to be home for me. Uh, this company has changed my life and the opportunity to hopefully impact others through our work here is something that we're very seriously committed to. And obviously, you know, something that you know, this is an opportunity for us to just build our relationship and engage more with the community and just in, improve our outreach and hopefully find solutions together. And I, I think we're very serious about doing that and really look forward to working with the, you know, with the town council as well as the community, you know, moving forward to do so. Appreciate your time. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody else? One thing, Mr. President, if I may. Sure. So, as, as the council knows, and some of the some of the citizens I here. Just say okay. Go. Hi. My name is Mitchell Delaney. Um, I live on Bristol Lane in Providence Farm. Um, 
like to say two pieces. Uh, the first is that I have smelled the cannabis in town before, but as a whole, I virtually never smell it at home. I think that's part to do with a really great forest that's behind my place. Um, and so pivoting to my next piece, um, I found a memo online from February 2020 uh, from the State of Maine Land Use Planning Commission that has that spoke to the odors, the lighting, different pieces associated with growing cannabis, both indoor and outdoor. So my request, I think, is to keep the Planning Commission involved with this process to include the odor component, but also to say that um, some of the pieces that are mentioned in this memo include vegetative buffers and setbacks, and this speaks to not only my house and really not being able to smell odors, but I think that there are already solutions all around, um, and one of them being more plants. So maybe more cannabis in the business park has raised some questions all around, but if vegetative buffers like more trees and more forests could be a solution to this, I'm a strong advocate for it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to let the town manager finish. Okay. So on, on August 10th, I attended the cannabis symposium, and I had to also had a nice conversation with Will Torberg, the, the administrator, the state's chief administrator for. Okay. On August the 10th, I attended a cannabis symposium um, for MML, and got to speak with Will Tilburg, who is the uh, director of the Maryland Cannabis Association. And I just wanted to share a few things. Some of those things the council already knows that a number of towns counties have already put in place moratoriums and moratoriums not on growth or anything else but moratorium on administrative actions until this 100 plus page law percolates down and we understand all the aspects associated with it from the tax structure to the zoning uh, regarding sales locations to uh, any of the imperatives along with zoning and a few of the things that were shared with us were that 25 percent of the license they anticipate for sales are going to come to the eastern shore that there isn't a current imperative for zoning changes because they're trying to figure out what what these are going to include uh, one of the issues that was brought up tonight was the nuisance statue or the the preemptive by conflict or, or allowance of smoking and interesting enough everybody's familiar with secondhand smoke is a danger but secondhand tobacco smoke was not found to be a nuisance in court law, in the court of law. So I found that kind of incongruent, but that's facts that they are. Um, so not changing any of our ordinance or anything until we see what percolates down from this, this thing. Others are looking at it that are more staffed to look at this and figure out what other towns and municipalities are going to do, other counties are going to do, <coughs> take an opportunity to look at that and see what applies to us and what doesn't apply to us. I know I reached out to the town manager in Hagerstown they have a grow area uh, and they deal with the the aroma and so they are farther down the stream than we are so that we can benefit from their experiences before we start making moves and passing rules i know the state has pushed back hard against prince george's county who wanted to move all of these activities into industrial parks and what they were told basically uh, from will was don't do anything. The state wants to promote this industry, and if everything gets out of line, the state's going to push back hard. So before we spend money on council and lawyers, let's wait and see what percolates out. This is a big law. It's a lot of change coming in. Um, so before we administratively burden ourselves, let's, let's wait and see what happens so that we aren't doing things and then possibly undoing things. Uh, and that gets into... Crystal working with our HR and safety sensitive and all the other aspects that go along with this. And as far as some of the aroma, one of my thoughts was, and I've talked to members over at GTI, I want to follow up with it, removing the, the used plants out to our farm and grinding it up, we found it cheaper to grind our own uh, waste from collecting leaves and trees and, and all in town property 
that we save money doing that. And then we can just scatter it out in our field. We've got a farm and let's use it for compost. It may work for both of us. So there are options here. I'm just asking the council before we start passing ordinances that we may have to undo later, let's let this percolate for a bit and figure out what's gonna happen over the next eight months where most of the moratoriums are. So that's my two cents. This Thank is the you. first time I've heard an administrator of a body of government express an opinion and not just support what council's asking. I'm, I'm appalled. I'm allowed I'm to speak for the charter over code. there expressing opinions on this instead of just addressing the facts. The Centerville Town Council will consider all comments presented this evening before making a final decision regarding proposed ordinance 5 2023. Is there a motion to adjourn this hearing? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I now declare this hearing adjourned. Mr. Mr. President, if I may, I would like to make a motion at this time. Um, and, and with a quick caveat, I think Ms. Uh, Brown and uh, Mr. Stevens have raised legitimate points about having the opportunity to be heard, which we of course did this evening. I think uh, Davis Emery from the business park raises legitimate concerns about, as he stated, being the last to know. And as the council's uh, economic development liaison, I'm sensitive to that and just want to respect that dynamic. So that being said, I wanted to make a motion this evening that we table any vote on this to a subsequent meeting. We have, we have to light on a date if we're going to do that. Can we can we just follow our agenda? I mean, we're in the mm -hmm. middle of a, we just adjourned a public hearing. We have another public have hearing another. on a to set the look of our town for the next 20 years and then address this issue when it's on the agenda. I'm inclined to agree, Councilmember Johnson. So don't get me wrong. Sure. I, I just would love for us to have some conversation before we do that and and also. I hope some people are here to talk about the community plan. <laughs> I, I, I That's just why I'm would, here. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I think there's also a bunch of folks here that are interested in action on this, and there were folks on this council that were prepared to pass this this evening. I'm asking that we delay that. So we do have we a motion go back on to the, the other conversation as well, if that's what we don't want to do. All right, I'll second the motion. We have a motion and a second. We need to identify a date. They've asked for six months. Six months from today is... The 21st of some month, six March. months from now, March, uh, March 21st. So, so, commensurate with a, a meeting of the town council. Sure, yeah, be, yeah. Can, can we say the meeting nearest to, or can you can you look at the calendar? The second, and say when that the, is? the second town council meeting in March. 21st of March. Wow. So we are tabling pending continued Actually, we're communication. We are we are postponing it. Tabling's a different, yeah, it's, it's think, properly we're postponing discussion. Yeah. So, I mean, right. isn't it's, some of this semantic, Sharon? <laughs> yes. yes. Town attorney, because, I mean, we, it, we could just do it all again. We could do this all over again. It, it's somewhat of semantics. I think you're, the, the charter requires you to pick a speci specified right. date when yes, you will consider it again. Right. March 21st. I mean, tabling, postponing, six and one, half dozen of the other. Um, so March 21st, 2024, there's a motion and a second. All those in favor say we'll go roll call. All those in favor will go down the line, actually. Councilperson Worth. Uh, no. Did you want to have some discussion yeah, before? Sure, yes, yeah, okay. sure. I have a couple, <laughs> point, couple points of discussion. Um, I just want to highlight what uh, Mr. Emery shared about the lack of notice, and, and this is something I've been really concerned about with this ordinance from the beginning. It felt like where things were left with a couple of members of the council and GTI was a very thought out response to an FAQ. And then without any further discussion, this sort of bubbles up. When this came up at a meeting, I reached out to um, GTI state level lobbyist just because that's a colleague of mine and so I knew him and I said, you know, hey, I don't know if, who represents them in town. I don't know if you're aware of this, you know, here you go. It feels crazy to me that had I not done that, there's the potential that this would have just gained legs without any notice to the employer that it seeks to harm, quite frankly. And I, you know, 
didn't even occur to me, and I apologize to Mr. Emery that it didn't that it didn't occur to me that there are other people who probably deserve notice as well. And I think when legislation is a redheaded Eskimo, something that affects one person or one entity, we absolutely owe it to that person or entity to have a thoughtful conversation on the issue. So. I have, I have serious notice issues about how this went down and the process that went in place. And so no matter how I felt about the substance of the ordinance, I would want to see us table it for, for those reasons alone. I also, you know, I live in Providence Farm. I live directly behind, I have no sense of direction, but somewhere right behind this building. And um, I, ca I can smell it. I'm not going to pretend to you that I can't smell it. I can. Um, so I agree that there if there's technology out there that can mitigate the smell, I, w I want Green Thumb to do absolutely everything they can to mitigate it. I have tiny children too. It's not like I want to live and raise them in a town that smells like marijuana. I don't. Um, but if we passed this, I agree with Mr. Stevens that why would GTI come to the table on those solutions when we cut them off at the knees? And so. I like the idea of tabling it for six months. I like the idea of keeping it on the schedule to keep everyone honest. Um, but I do really have process issues. I, I understand the concerns and I agree. And as someone who lives, you know, I looked at the map, I live really close to it. I live as close or closer than most residents of Symphony Village. And so totally agree with the concerns about the smell. I'd like to think that we could have gotten GTI to this place. And I believe that we could have by simply asking for the conversation without the ordinance. I wish our rooms were this packed every night, so I'll see that as a silver lining, that there's people here to care about an issue that matters in town. But I think we have to give them a chance, and so I'm very much in favor of delaying this for six months to give GTI a chance to improve the situation. I can be in favor of this, but not six months. Um, would I'll ask town council here, are, can we retable if we say tabled for two months, brought it up, discussed, learned their status, we could say, yeah, look, let's table this for another two months. Yes. So I would offer a friendly amendment that instead of six months, it'd be two months, so we can get a fresh update um, and move on from there. I withdraw my support of the motion if that amendment is on it. I, I would support that amendment. Go ahead, Joe. Thank you. I just want to be heard because we have to put the plan together. We would Gotta like come 90, 90 days at a minimum if you are so inclined to want to update and a report. We would also agree right here, right now, that we'll come to you within 90 days, even if you have six months. So, but, you know, if you want to put it on and have it have, go through all this again in 90 days, we won't be done in 90 days. We've told you that. Um, but we will commit to, you can put it on the calendar right now. We'll come back or we'll coordinate with, um, with uh, the town clerk and, and Ms. Um, Van Amberg. We have a motion and a second for a six-month delay. The seconder has declined the amendment. I would like to amend the motion for a three-month, um, to make it a three-month delay the amendment has, has to, to be it. withdrawn or yeah he, he has to change the motion. I'll, or we vote on it right I'll, I'll withdraw the original amendment suggested and 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 hear yours now if you don't mind saying that again right, so so the okay. the motion has been withdrawn does Robert say that I need to withdraw my amendment it wasn't no, friendly so. so all right <laughs> all right uh Trying to stay on track. Okay. I'd like to make a motion that we table that. Well, I'd like to amend the motion to, to table the discussion for three months. So I need to pick a specific date here. Uh, it's our 21st. Is well, we'll be meeting. Christmas. Oh, Christmas. <laughs> All right. Now let's make it um, January 4th. Maybe March 21st? January 4th. <laughs> They, they could, and for an up, for an update, but we're we're not yes. okay. Right. Second. Okay. Is there any discussion about this? So what 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 are we, what is the motion? <laughs> motion is to instead instead okay to amend your. Um, I there think is no there amendment. Is no, no motion on the table. No, no need to amend anything. Council Member Johnson. Well, you're making an original motion. motion. Okay, I'm making an original motion that we. T um, uh, Continue this discuss postpone discussion until January fourth. Second. Jim second. 
Are you seconding or saying the second? No, I'm seconding. Okay. Yeah. We have a new motion. Brand new motion, brand new second. Discussion on this? Councilperson Worth? Aye. Councilperson Kaiser? Aye. 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 I've never been more sure of anything in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I, I would like to say something as a point of order, and that is just when we have business in front of us, it is all equally important. So I'm disappointed that our president would say, I'm here for the Centerville Community Plan and, and suggesting somehow that because we're trying to prioritize decisions, which we all unanimously did, that that was at the expense of what's next on the agenda. I too am here for that as well as everything on this agenda. I apologize for the distasteful joke. I accept that and now I find it funny. <laughs> I'm here for it all, just to be clear. All right, we are gonna move into our second public hearing now on the community plan. The subject of this hearing is resolution 11-2023 for the purpose of adopting the town of Centerville 2023 community plan. We'll make a motion we recess for about a minute. <laughs> Can you guys hold your conversations once you leave take the your, room? Take your conversations off the floor. <laughs> right, we'll just vision for the town for 20 more years. Nobody listens to this stuff anyway, so I'll go ahead and read it. The subject, the, <laughs> the subject of this hearing is Resolution 11-2023 for the purpose of adopting the Town of Centerville 2023 Community Plan recommended for adoption by the Town of Centerville Planning and Zoning Commission pursuant to the Land Use Article of the Annotated Code of Maryland. I will now provide background on Resolution 11-2023. Uh, so this has been in progress for quite some time, I think about two years. And I, I guess it probably would have made some sense to have this, this presentation before this uh, public hearing, but I guess we'll proceed. You know, there are some important questions in this plan. The Planning Commission has done a nice job. They've worked very hard. Uh, certainly not everything in this is unanimous, but uh, I look forward to the discussion. And I'll also clarify that we can, uh, we can approve this resolution tonight. It is a resolution. There are no further hearings statutorily required to do this here, um, but also we can we can continue to talk about it. We do not have to pass it tonight, and we can have uh, future conversations certainly after this one tonight. I will now call Carolyn Brinkley, town clerk, to present evidence of the published notice of this hearing. Certificate of Publication, State of Maryland. County of Queen Anne's, this is to certify that the Annex legal advertisement has been published in the September 8th and September 15th Bay Times Record Observer. We will first hear from all those in favor of proposed resolution 11-2023 and then hear from those opposed. Please keep all comments to three minutes. You are welcome to provide written testimony to the town council as well. We will dispense with uh, the public comment guidelines. We heard those already, but do please abide by that three minute rule. We will now hear from all those in favor of proposed resolution 11-2023. We will now hear from all those opposing Proposed resolution 11-2023. Just come on up and state your name and, and generally where you live. You don't have to give us your address. Thanks, Ernie. Thank you. There you go, Jim. Let me see. I, I made a 
Good evening. Uh, my name is Ernie Sota from Green Development. I have the uh, Carter Farm development site under agreement with the owner. Um, we have uh, a few comments. We um, are we uh, is this the three minute rule, by the way? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> All right. We uh, appreciate that the Planning Commission has spent time with this draft comp plan. Uh, we have some comments. We note that the draft plan calls for the elimination of the TND zoning district. We note that the TND zoning district was unanimously adopted by town council via ordinance 13 2013 after several well attended town meetings and significant public discussion and input. Uh, there are many aspects of the TND that we think are beneficial to the town and therefore eliminating it uh, is counter to the best interests of the town. The draft plan talks about why um, and also suggests that rezoning Carter Farm to R1 is appropriate. Uh, this would have a profound impact on the site and we believe make the development of the Carter Farm plan infeasible but also the development of the site infeasible uh, for many reasons. It would make the lots uh, so expensive that they would not be marketable. The reasons for the suggested change to R1 are given on page 29 of the draft plan. It said the, the Planning Commission has reviewed multiple development plans and its experience has informed the Commission that the TND provisions should not be applied to the Carter Farm. We note that the Planning Commission participated with the developers on many occasions to do significant text amendments and they were voted uh, and approved. The um, conditional approval was also voted and approved and the Planning Commission also voted and approved the uh, growth allocation be forwarded to Council. So we're quite surprised by that statement. Draft plan uh, says uh, traffic congestion is a problem. Uh, we did a, a traffic study and that study is available uh, and it shows there's no degradation in a service A free flow condition. It talks about uh, commercial competition with the CBD. Later, however, the plans notes that uh, commercial should be expanded. We note that the amount of proposed commercial is relatively small. Uh, there are, uh, w there's one building that is a uh, facility to help uh, process the farm uh, produce, the Carter farmhouse itself as well that we're marketing uh, to be either a small restaurant or a B&B. &B. Um, and then there's two buildings along uh, Chesterfield that are 2,800 square feet. So uh, we believe that uh, uh, all of this uh, designation as R1 would prevent many of the local goals and certainly the state goals uh, for good planning. Thank you. I assume all that's reflected in here and more? And more. Yes, <laughs> Do you want three minutes? Pick up where I left sure. off. <laughs> <laughs> well, just uh, to hit a, a few of the highlights, I think the um, Ryan Showalter, Ryan Showalter uh, appearing um, with comments specifically regarding the recommendation to remove the TND designation from the Carter Farm property. The, um, the plan has a number of goals, and uh, I think when you look at the Carter Farm development, which this council has has reviewed and, and paused largely because of sewer capacity issues, the Carter Farm plan as presented implements many of those goals. And I won't read each point, but the letter identifies a number of different ways in which the land plan that, that the Planning Commission recommended to you uh, implements those goals. The, um, the plan also addresses Maryland statutory visions for comprehensive planning. And, and when you look at those, uh, there are 12 different visions articulated by state law that comprehensive plans uh, are supposed to address. Um, and again, the, the Carter Farm TND design that is, is still active before the town council implements those 12 visions in many different ways. Removal of the TND designation would result in a by right, you know, R1 subdivision. But when you look at the Carter Farm property and you take out the, the critical area buffer, you get to a density that's far less than smart growth density and you, you end up with a, a potential project that doesn't implement either the town's goals or the state land planning vision.
decisions. Um, and so for the reasons more clearly articulated in the letter, we, we respectfully believe that the TND designation uh, is appropriate. It's very thoughtful. Uh, it, it, it came to the town after a great deal of discussion, uh, and it, it was supported by both um, the, the citizen planners, uh, the staff, and by discussions with the council uh, up until recently. So we'd request that you retain that designation for the Carter Farm. Thank, Thank you. you both. My name is <clears throat> my name is Ed Ritty, and uh, I've been working with the Olaf family, who are the owners of the property, for about four or five years. And when we looked at the plan that was approved before, we thought there was a, a better way to plan this specific piece because it's sensitive. And so <clears throat> we studied uh, some things out west where uh, the development would be significantly less uh, impervious coverage and less density. Trying to create a community that is pedestrian walkway fed, open up to open space, and eliminate as many roads as possible. Uh, we found it a, a terrific example that you can look up, which is Red Bud Way in Nevada City, California. Gorgeous, gorgeous development. So <clears throat> in your process and your, di your discussions, I think if you look at Mr. Soda's background and you look at the, uh, the plan that he has put forth, it really is unique and it really could help the community. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kinley Bray with YVS Law. I'm here on behalf of the property owner of Carter Farm, uh, as referenced by Mr. Riddy, the old the uh, Olaf family. Um, we respectfully request that the council reconsider the Planning Commission's recommendation to eliminate the TND zoning uh, on Carter Farm. The purpose of the TND designation adopted more than 10 years ago was to signal a preference for patterns consistent with pre-World War II residential neighborhoods featuring a mix of housing types, grid streets, open spaces, institutional uses, and small-scale complementary commercial uses. A downzoning of this property by eliminating the TND zone will not allow for that mix of uses Use, use or housing choices. R1 would eliminate potential for varying lot sizes and housing types. Uh, and as page 47 of the community plan states, future neighborhood development in Centerville should favor creative arrangements of open spaces and neighborhood design that prioritize high accessibility to parks over run-of-the-mill platting of lots that maximize the yield of lots. The proposed elimination of TND zoning would do just that. Um, I also note that the um, the Planning Commission's completion of the updated plan was undertaken at a time when <clears throat> my understanding is that the town had lost its professional uh, planner. Um, we would ask that the council not take action until there's been an opportunity to um, replace Mr. Jakubiak and, and uh, have the advice and counsel of a professional planner um, to understand the impacts of removing uh, TND and the uh, other development tools such as planned unit development uh, for parcels like Carter Farm. And uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions, but appreciate your consideration and your time tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask your last name again? I'm it's sorry. It's Bray, B-R-A-Y. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else opposed to the resolution? Hi, my name's Sandy Huffer. Good evening. I reside at 212 Corsica Street, and I hope to someday purchase a home at Carter Farm based on the current proposed project plan. I'm excited about the possibility of this community being a model for environmental sustainability and community engagement. The draft and comprehensive plan proposes this zoning to be changed from TND, TND, which was approved last year by town council, to R1, which I do not support. 
This change in zoning would not allow the current project to move forward, which has incredible benefits to the town. The current project would provide access to public open space, including integration to the town trail system. That would be a public amenity with two overlook areas for public access. Preserves approximately five acres of farm and its agricultural heritage. This will provide the community with direct access to local food, improve soil conditions due, due to the adoption of sustainable farming that would be practices on that land and improve it and support the habitat. The buffer zone along the waterway will be reforested and expanded with additional tree canopy of 1.5 acres. Provides low impact development with net zero homes and lower water requirements that will minimize the impact on the town water treatment system which is top of mind of everybody right now. The Carter Farm Farmhouse will be preserved and integrated into the project, which is very important to this town, I believe. The small commercial space will support local businesses that, that with an extended focus on wellness and food-oriented products and services that will serve existing residents. The 126 housing units will be of mixed types and sizes and price points to allow more affordable housing, which again is very important to our community and the nation. The architecture along Chesterfield Avenue is intended to be a similar character of existing homes of the neighborhood. The R1 zoning would eliminate all this project offers and not smart growth that supports the residents and the historical heritage of Centerville. Thank you very much for your time. Thank Appreciate you. It. Thank you. Anyone else opposed to the resolution? The Centerville Town Council will consider all comments presented this evening before making a final decision regarding proposed resolution 11-2023. Do I hear a motion to adjourn this hearing? So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? I declare this hearing adjourned. We're going to go into a citizens forum if anybody has anything they'd like to say that wasn't addressed in the uh, prior public hearings or maybe that was Just an additional three minutes okay we'll move into old business now we've already cleared ordinance 5-2023 so we will move into festivities and beautification team which is council member johnson Thank you. I would like to invite uh, one of my partners in crime, Mary Calling Officer from Symphony Village, to come up. She'll be uh, jointly briefing with me. We've had a very heavy set of topics on the agenda tonight, so we're hoping that this brings a little bit of joy and holiday cheer uh, at this time. So, And thank you. Uh, our HR director is helping to pull up the slides, so we appreciate that. And as those are coming up, um, just to clarify, so we have a uh, partnership uh, that, that between the town's existing boards, and particularly the Parks Advisory Board, um, town staff, uh, our subject matter experts have been working in tremendous partnership with what is the privately community-based Centerville Festivities and Beautification Team. And one of the projects that came up uh, several months ago was why don't we have a Christmas committee? And so we launched that, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. Um, we're going to talk about our team structure, the holiday committee update. Mm -hmm. I was, I'm oh, sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess I should have told you I had a clicker. clicker. <laughs> um, the update that we have and then our next steps. So our team structure for festivities and beautification, Wendy Hubbard and Scott Eggert are our co-chairs for beautification and then Mary and I have the distinct privilege of uh, co-chairing the festivities side. Um, one of the first things that we did when we met, um, and I'm going to then um, turf to Mary for this slide, is the idea that the holidays for the town of Centerville for our very diverse community go beyond Christmas. So I know it can rub people the wrong way when we say holiday committee, but guess what? Um, 
we're celebrating Christmas, Hanukkah, other festivities and traditions that are important to our community, and we want to be inclusive. So with that, Mary, if you want to take it away, and okay. I can move the slides for you. Our initial meeting for the holiday uh, committee was uh, July 24th, and we meet monthly the fourth Monday at 7 o'clock right here. And everybody is welcome. We'd like as many people to come as we can. Uh, has as are able. Now, we decided on a theme for the Christmas parade and the um, the decorating, yep. Yep. House decorating and the house decorating <laughs> contest as heroes. So this would be um, if you had EMTs, nurses, teachers, uh, police officers, veterans, uh, superheroes for the kids, any any Anyone who would be a hero would, could, could be your theme. So the parade is going to be all heroes. So it's going to be really exciting to see what everybody comes up with with the heroes. And then as far as the holiday committee update for the projects for this year, uh, since we didn't have fireworks this year, we're, we would like to use some of that money for our holiday activities and decorations. And uh, Ashley Kaiser and Eric Johnson are going to be handling that. Then we uh, wanted to have some expanded uh, and improved holiday decorations downtown. And that's going to be the Parks Board, Ashley Kaiser, and Rich Ryan. The Festival of Lights and Music will be at the courthouse, and we're proposing right now uh, to start Wednesday, uh, November 28th through Sunday, 12-2, and that would be Eric Johnson and myself. And then we wanted to promote Letters to Santa, and that would be primarily in partnership with the Centerville American Legion Auxiliary. And then the store window decorating contest would be Eric and myself, and um, that would also be Heroes, the Heroes theme. And then uh, we had initially spoken about having the Holiday House Tour come back, uh, but we decided that that was pushing it for this year. Uh, and we want to do a really nice job. So we've put that off until 2024, and uh, we'll use the Legacy Foundation templates and period costumes, and that would be Eric and Elaine. Okay. Excellent. And then I just wanted to clarify, so I don't know that we're prepared, Ashley and I, tonight to ask for a specific amount, but as two of the folks from the council that have been um, coming to those meetings and, and giving input and, and helping to kind of be a liaison to the official functions of the town, um, I think at some point soon we would come back with maybe a price tag. I know um, our town manager has been able to uh, share with me some of the uh, packages that, that he has visibility on for various town decorations. We know how much of a concern the deterioration of our existing decorations is, so we're mindful of that. But again, we're not necessarily prepared to ask for anything tonight, but just wanted to kind of draw your attention to that. Um, as was alluded to also, the, so the town-wide house decorating contest will be a new thing. It's done at Symphony Village every year since I think Symphony Village started is probably history if I was to guess, but um, to have a theme that sort of marries up to the, the parade theme, and this is the earliest we've been able to get that out. So needless to say, we're very excited about everything that's coming together, um, and uh, Wreaths Across America is another component. Um, just wanted to share, this is not the approved calendar, but it gives you a feel for one of the other elements, which is uh, to produce a late November through early January uh, 2024, as it should say at the top, uh, calendar of events. So in green you see sort of the established holiday periods, Hanukkah, Christmas Eve, Christmas Day of course, New Year's Eve, New Year's Day. Uh, Kwanzaa is also shown there. Uh, we've got winter solstice day, for, winter solstice, excuse me, first day of winter. And then um, you see a variety of events that um, we already have visibility on. So our plan is to continue to populate this with community feedback and ideas. Uh, I'm pleased to report that in addition to what we have already, we have some folks of the Islamic faith that we've been talking with who are interested in sponsoring a prayer session that would be at the courthouse. Um, uh, Ramadan is, is something that, as you all probably are aware, fluctuates different times a year. There's not 
not such a holiday or celebration in December of this year. So uh, to be inclusive, um, these folks have asked if we could do that, and I, I think that's a, a really fair uh, request. So we'll be publishing this as we get into late November, and um, this document would have hyperlinks to uh, more information about the events, how to get tickets, the cost, locations, all of that great detail. Um, next steps, what's not on here that I really hope we could at least have endorsement tonight, I don't know that in light of it being a $500 or, left, or less purchase, this council needs to take uh, official action. If we do, um, then I would encourage that. But one of the things that came up at our very first meetings was to um, have a town menorah uh, as part of our traditional display. And so uh, that came with a 100% unanimous recommendation from the holiday committee. And so I did want to present that for at least uh, a consensus this evening. And then as you see, and we'll come right back to that. Um, so for October, uh, we do want to let the beautification team side uh, provide an update. So we'll, we'll look to schedule that. In November, we would brief the council again with, with the holiday committee's updates. Late November, we'll release this, the events calendar that I mentioned on the previous slide. December, we'll execute the projects. And then in January, we'll have an after action committee meeting to assess kind of how we did and what we might want to do differently next year. So it's the fourth Monday of each month at 7 p.m. here in this very room. So for anybody interested. Um, so I draw your attention back to just the question about the town menorah. That concept has uh, permeated out into the, the residents of this community, and in particular, our Jewish community residents, I think, are more than in, in favor of this. So I leave that with you. We have consensus for that? Certainly. Yeah. I think it's great. Yeah. Sounds good. And that concludes our update. Mary, thank you for coming tonight to brief with me. All right. Thank you very much, Councilmember Johnson. Thank you all. We're going to make a couple friendly changes here. We're going to move right into uh, the community plan briefing from the Planning Commission uh, members. So if we could have that, uh, them come up and get situated and put their presentation back up there, I apologize. Thanks, Crystal. More the merrier. Excuse me. One of you can sit over here too. The microphone. Oh yeah. All right. Um, All want a clicker? There's a clicker. <laughs> this is my first time with a clicker. Okay. How do I do? I just like just the back hand here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. And just make sure you're close to the microphones and speaking up, please. Have a seat, Pat. Don't fall. Don't fall, no, don't fall back. Thank you. Spin you around just once. Okay. I'm a bit dizzy. I printed out a couple of these just to follow along with some of the notes that I'm following along with. Um, hi. <laughs> um, Kara Willis. Tim Zavon. And Mitchell Delaney. <laughs> it's Emmerich. Pat Fox. We're the majority of your planning commission. Um, let's see. Yeah. Um, so, how to start. Um, I've got this presentation put together, and if any of you have a, have a question as we go along, I think we're all totally free to, you know, answer questions on the fly. Um, there's a lot in this. Uh, to start out, we actually began this process in 2019, um, so we're really glad that you now have it in front of you. Um, basically, okay, so I, I don't know how much any of you uh, have as far as, or know as far as how the, the background of the comprehensive plan works. Um, I'll go into this. Why do we do this? Um, first off, our guiding principle is land use article 66B. Um, so it gives us the outline, the chapters that we're going to be looking at. Uh, they do add chapters and uh, suggest content that have to go into the chapters, which is, you'll see some of that language in there, and I'll address that when we get to it. Um, so, introduction. 
and we are on slide three. Um, okay, so obviously a big thing that we are having to contend with is the wastewater treatment plant. Um, that, there's a lot of that that's going to continue to go through this plan. It's going to touch in several different chapters. Um, what we're looking at in the uh, picture on the upper right is the, the f pointing out that Centerville, the entirety of Centerville, is a public, a, a, a municipal priority funding area. Um, and so that is obviously really important when it comes to things like trying to get state financing help for uh, an, a, a huge wastewater treatment plant upgrade. Um, the, the, the way that that happens is as far as, as of 1997, uh, when the state implemented the priority funding areas, they, uh, anything that was already a municipality at that point, any of the, anything inside of municipal boundary limits at that time were automatically considered to be a priority funding area. Um, as time has gone on, and I believe at that point, Northbrook was already part of the town. I think that Symphony Village was annexed in after that. Um, when we get into densities and things, Symphony Village, because it's an active adult community, does have a density of 3.5 units per acre, so that wasn't a problem with them, I guess, coming, getting wrapped into our, our priority funding area. Um, so, this is just a quick overview, statistics. Um, one of the things that we did notice as a trend is that our population is on average aging, or I guess the, the, the majority are, of, of us are 65 and over. Um, that's probably gone up, uh, you'll see that in your pie charts, I think it's only, I mean, might be a difference of four degrees more and four degrees less of 18 and under, but that's what we've got in town right now. Um, and, okay, so I think that's covering that. Okay, so chapter three, municipal growth. This is a big part of what we have to pay attention to and upgrade, and one of the biggest things that we decided to do here um, on your on your right-hand side, what you're looking at is the current uh, municipal boundaries, your, your, your bleh, municipal growth map. And then on the left is what we are proposing. And you'll notice that on the far left-hand lower corner, there's a chunk that's been taken out, um, which would have, let's see, which would have been growth area nine and four. <coughs> And the reason that we decided to take that out, and if anybody wants to chime in here, um, we took that out because, you know, one of the parts that we have to consider is, you know, there are trends in in in, in traffic changes. There are, there are, ten years ago we didn't have, or I guess no, fourteen years ago we didn't have this building or any kind of concept that we were going to have a YMCA down here, and and you know this side of town was going to really going to be where the bulk of of new construction was going to be happening. So we thought it makes more sense to direct new growth to the east side of town, and given that we have road constraints, we've got natural resource constraints on that far side. Talking about doing a lot of infill off of Route 18 just didn't seem to be something that we should be trying to try to move toward. So that's our that's the biggest part of the municipal growth. Oh, and the Tidewater property, which is on your on both maps, on your right side, you'll see that kind of triangular area. Um, and that was not part of the growth area. It has been added. And also the purple hatched area, that is what was 
the last comp plan considered to be the community business park, or it was a future community business park. Uh, the county has since abandoned that idea, so we thought, what are we gonna do with it next? And... Another piece to add uh, with removing the growth area off of the lower corner um, by 213, uh, we, had a, we have a vision to keep that area as a uh, natural resource gateway to Centerville. Um, we want to maintain the harness of the green the plants, um, kind of make that the, the gateway, the, the nicest part of, of entering Centerville and, and really capitalize on greenery. I guess another thing to touch on would be the purple bubble that is no longer there. Um, the first draft of the plan had an indication of the possibility of some kind of uh, coordination between the town and the county uh, regarding the 213-301 intersection. And feedback that we got from the county was large, largely that they were not interested in, in, um, in, in playing with us out there, uh, or at least not the way that we thought we may want to do that. So we decided that we would remove that area for consideration uh, until further notice. Um, we really wanted to be able to continue to have you know, any commercial business or potential come into town instead of remain outside of municipal limits, and that's not really helping us do anything except increase traffic. It was really a, a vision of the gateway to yeah. the town. We wanted, you know, a, a nice off-ramp into town, not surrounded by whatever the county wanted to put in there. So, and then that was the other reason for that. It was a, a trying to control the traffic flow. We, one of my biggest issues as a member of this uh, um, commission is traffic, and I happened to arrive home at the perfect time where there's a backup at Corsival Road that has at times extended to um, Symphony Village. And directing all the growth to this east side would help us create another exit and entrance into town. Yeah, those traffic concerns through town really played a, a huge part of what changed a lot of, of this plan. Um, do, we, do we know where that traffic is going that backs up from Corsival to Symphony Village? Well, one of our recommendations moving forward is that the town, in some, in, in some semi-regular basis, uh, have a traffic survey. Um, you know, because that, those are, when you really get into laying all that, all those pieces out and, you know, you can really accurately figure out who's making a right-hand turn when you come into town on, you know, Kidwell, or who's continuing through uh, into Northbrook, and who's making a right at Broadway. Um, the, the, those traffic studies are obviously a big expense, so that's something as part of a recommendation that, you know, for, for council to, to consider. Um, I mean, I, I want to just, for some reason, I think a number is maybe between ten and fifteen thousand dollars, or something like that, every time that we do that. So it's not something that we need all the time, but given that there is a really significant uptick uh, in traffic uh, over the past decade, um, and we do have some data in later on in the transportation uh, chapter, but when we were compiling all this information, we also had to consider that we had. Uh, we had COVID happening and there was a lot of, you know, normal traffic patterns were most definitely changed, yet yeah, ab right, abnormal. So. Um, I just add, I, I wanna echo those sentiments because I think the, the move to strategically invest in the Tidewater property and in that side of town is tremendously important and helpful. Um, but clearly there's still opportunities to do things in the business park and so make no mistake, we're gonna see continued traffic and potentially increases, increases in that. So I applaud any effort that any of us have and you all uh, would endorse to pursue such a traffic assessment and study. Yeah, and, and hearing the conversations uh, with GTI and the fact that they've got 
about 200 employees and want to add more, that's when you start thinking about, oh, well, if, if, when we do have a full build out at the, at the business park, that is going to be a significant addition to existing traffic flow. Um, and then, and then another part of another few parts, uh, uh, and I'm not, I, these, that hasn't, this part hasn't been directly put in here. I just didn't want to squirrel. Um, but we have also over the past 10 years or 14 years, we didn't have the 301, uh, 305 overpass, which has been an enormous, uh, improvement. Um, and so really able to safely, you know, have have a, a much higher traffic flow over there than we used to because, as Eric, I'm sure, remembers, that was not a good intersection back when we were growing Indeed. up. <clears throat> okay, so next, I'll hand this over to Tim. <laughs> there, we had uh, tried to come up with an idea for that, that uh, I guess, that industrial area, and one of the things that we came up with was a technology and enterprise district uh, of course ted was the name that we came up with and we're looking to you know make sure that we maintain the rights to that name but uh <laughs> but anyway it is just basically it would be a uh, kind of like a cam business campus with you know specific businesses that come in or technologies that come in or even medical you know facilities um kind of like a, a you know just a, a campus for um, I guess uh, the, the businesses a to Google bring, yeah. how about a Google right. <laughs> Google we want Google we're gonna try and get Google to come out um, but it, but again it was just you know something that would provide you know some some high-end or, or higher-end you know jobs that would come into the town and help spend more money and get businesses to grow and yeah, and right offhand, I can't remember what kind of acreage we're talking about that is now on that side of um, of town up against the uh, 305 and 301 intersection. But it's a, it's a significant amount of property. That's the acreage there would definitely afford, you know, a large scale, you know, single entity campus. So, um, and and then also that differentiates this area. From competing from what we're still trying to do in the in the PBD, you know we don't we want to have purposes uh, and uses and and areas for different businesses entirely. So, um, okay, um, Nancy, do you want to? <laughs> so. This is the the, uh, the the enlargement of the CBD and uh, incorporation of the limited residential units. And I think this was one of Nancy's uh, brainstorms. I think what we were envisioning here was to continue to develop the business area downtown and extend it up um, railroad. railroad. Railroad Avenue, as far as um, Little Hut, right? Little Hut, yeah, yeah, the street next to um, Acme, and um, <clears throat> with businesses of a similar type that we have there now, where there would be a storefront uh, at the street level and possibly housing above them, so rental units. One of the things that the that has been observed in the town is that we don't have a lot of rental units available for folks in general. Um, so it makes it difficult for younger folks to start up here in Centerville. And so we thought that um, we would try to encourage growth of that type um, and it would be walkable you could conceivably walk through all the way up. And, and and the homes that are on the other side of the road, of course, would still remain. So it would be residential and a little bit of commercial mixed in. Right, something a little bit less intensive than what is currently the C2 that's adjacent to those those houses that are, that are along railroad. Um, yeah, and then also, Banjo Lane is currently in the in the CBD, and um, and that's 
largely warehouse. You know, you've got a couple, maybe one or two nice brewery type uh, places down at the end. But with the build out of the potential build out of Turpin Farm, you really have a kind of a, a little bit empty space between, uh, uh, you know, the intent of a high density <clears throat> farm or a high density infill development project like Durban Farm out to what is existing in the CBD. So maybe the banjo lane would be something that <clears throat> if we were able to kind of do a mixed use blocks of, so that's why, that's why this picture is up here. I think this is historic Alexandria, our old town Alexandria. But <clears throat> the fact that you've got, you know, a few could be townhouse units that are uh, adjacent to storefronts and things like that to, to mix. So you do have people that are actually not just shopping downtown, but living downtown and have, you know, more of that street front pedestrian access. Um, let's see. I think Pennsylvania Avenue is a prime candidate to yes. kickstart that sort of effort, especially since mm -hmm. the town owns the other side, the empty side. Correct. We would have the ability to incent proper development of that and make kind of a new downtown, no government allowed. <laughs> well, we didn't give any specific uh, directives regarding that parcel because it is already owned by the town. So, um, but I believe that it is part of the central business district. I don't think it is. I don't think it just stops on the one yeah. side of the street, but yeah. Because yeah. we were talking about just that is that whole Pennsylvania mm -hmm. Avenue kind of continuing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but building on the other side would offer a great opportunity to really <clears throat> continue that going. Of course, now I'm... <clears throat> Jim, if I could just make a comment, you could start drafting an RFP to go out for developers for that other side of the street. Oh, boy. Like that idea? I do. <laughs> I second that. <laughs> So while we have a picture, yeah, go ahead. Next slide. Oh, okay. uh, so while we have a picture of Old Town Alexandria right here, um, part of the the vision of <coughs> building up mixed use, uh, expanding the central business district district along a railroad, um, but we also envision creation of a um, of a historic district in downtown. Now, hope to be clear that we are not envisioning that every building has brick front and slate roofs and 300 year old windows. What we are envisioning is um, the creation of this historic district, which would allow us to tap into federal and state funds, uh, which would help to boost what is already existing. Uh, the corner of railroad and commerce that empty building that's been sitting there for ages and is maybe being sold, is maybe not. Um, we'd like to boost Main Street, and we think that a way to do that could be some type of historic district. What, hasn't that corner been sold? I thought it was, yes. Yeah, I believe they closed like a month ago. Yeah. Okay. It's awesome. <laughs> well, if we establish a historic district, maybe they could get some tax credits to help them along with the project. That would be great. Okay, let's see. Um, yeah, and, and to be clear, the, the downtown area is currently part of, I believe it's on the, on the Maryland Historic Register. I think there are buildings, I don't, I don't know if you've looked into this, Dan. Um, there are some buildings that are in the district, the historic, the Maryland Historic District that are also in the National Historic Register. But we don't have any criteria that that means anything particularly to Centerville as as it stands right now. <sighs> okay, <clears throat> so here we go. Um, this is something that <laughs> it probably was the longest debated um, uh, portion of the plan. And um, <sighs> so let's see, where do we start with this? The, the intent of, and, and this was actually something that was, this concept was, was pitched by our town planner, is to create basically a kind of, right now the PUD is an overlay, and the original intent of the PUD was 
uh, as a tool for annexation, and that's why the town council is involved on that level. So the complexity with using the PUD right now <coughs> is that it does bounce now the site plans and approval process and all that bounces back and forth between the town council and the planning commission, and that's not something that typically happens. So we do have some recommendations there that set up a, a, a more streamlined way to do that. Um, inside of that, the intent of, of the PUD is to basically provide a tool to where we can sort of create something that would look and, and function like what the TND language states now. We're not trying to say that we want to do and we don't want to take an, you know, we're not, we're not taking a turn away from what that TND on the Carter farm, what we wanted it to look like, but Instead, what we want to be able to do is play around inside of the, uh, the subdivision regulations um, to where you know, we can maybe play around with different size lots inside of uh, one zoning code instead of having you know, R1 is 10,000. How about if we can have R1, or if we're talking about a density, then it more not tied to a square footage of a lot size, but maybe we're talking about a, a you know, a, a units per acre accounting instead of, you know, we want, we could, we could have three houses per gross acre and all of them have to be 30 feet off the front yard line or front yard, you know, offset. Um, that's not something that we want to do. And, um, and so the ability to, to go in and really play around with that and, and get what that what that intent was and get it across all the zoning districts is something we don't have right now. So it gives us an opportunity to, to really put forward to developers in the future what we want to see. And when it's mandatory or when it's part of the zoning code, that, that it gives us discretion, but it gives the developers much tighter you know, regulations and rules that they need to abide by to make sure that we're getting what we want from the beginning. Um, and then the other part of that is that the subdivision regulations do not have uh, open space requirements across all of the, all of the different zoning uh, districts. I think, I don't think R1 has it, but I think R2 and R3 has it, um, which is something that we should, that should be mandatory. We should have more open space requirements across all the zoning codes. And also, active. There's a difference between active open space and passive open space. Active open space meaning parks, tot lots, playgrounds, uh, not you know, uh, 10 acres of, of, a, of a field in the middle of a development. Um, so be more intentional about not just the open space that we're asking for, but what we want it, how we want it to function. Let's say. Okay, I'm sure some of these numbers are are going to be familiar to you. Um, in the and one of the prior chapters, we have a f couple different forecasted growth figures. We went with the one in the middle to move these f numbers forward. Um, part of what this community facilities uh, does is that's going to be what the state, that's going to be the kind of thing that the state is going to want to look at and review as part of this comp plan when it comes to funding for the wastewater treatment plant. So all of this data, it gets a little stale in there, but it's in there for a reason. <laughs> and... Okay, transportation. Um, so this does have two parts, which is not just the roads, but also the trails. Um, and on the left-hand side, you're gonna see, again, sort of the direction that we're trying to have new development come in going more to the east side of town. Um, and then 
there are some pretty aggressive long-term uh, kind of roads that go around the outside and roundabouts and things like that. This isn't something that you know we're talking about doing in the next five years, but it's as these growth areas are filled in, these are things that we want to consider <laughs> for the long term. And so that comes down to we want developers to put in a road that goes from here to there. If it's on the, you know, it, it's, it's about connecting, right? I mean, you got to put a sidewalk here and you put a sidewalk here and then eventually the sidewalk in the middle, somebody's going to come in and put that sidewalk in. So it's kind of what this is. Okay, let's see, where are we? Transportation, slide nine, chapter nine. Might be the last thing. So last I, thing? Okay. I'd like to uh, kick this off if I can. So the new plans introduction states, number five, guide the location, layout, and character of future neighborhoods. Quote, open land could be developed as conventional single-use residential subdivisions or in ways that distinguish them as excellent neighborhoods unique to Centerville. Later on in the document, it states Maryland's visions for comprehensive planning. Vision number seven, a range of housing densities, types, and sizes provides residential options for citizens of all ages and incomes. Is it your opinion to, to, that the rezoning of the Carter Farm property from TND to R1 is counter to those two statements. I think that that's a piece that would have to, that would also happen in tandem with the PUD zoning overlying it. So the idea here is that, so, so I want to be clear that the, as currently zoned TND, Carter Farm is about five units per acre, it's 43 acres, it's 215 units. Mm -hmm. That's far in excess of the current site plan. As a R1, Correct. the property would be 129 units, which is close to where the, the site plan is in density. 28 as it's been so, proposed. So I guess my question is, is the problem, what problem are we trying to solve on Carter Farm by rezoning the property R1? And is there a better tool to achieve the goals of the Planning Commission is trying to achieve on that piece of property. Would anyone else like to speak to that? <laughs> I, I fought for a long time. Personally, I fought for a long time uh, to keep the TND language uh, intact. Um, the density, I think that really the crux of the density uh, reduction um, and without having a, I mean, if we could, if we just decided to go in and say, we'll just change the TNT from five units per acre to three units per acre, um, we, that could have been something that we did, but there was not a consensus on, on doing that. Um, we had a lot of feedback from the community uh, that had concerns about, actually, it was more about kind of that traffic that's coming into town. And 10 years ago, the, I mean, the comp plan in 2009 that recommended the creation of a TND at a five units per acre density didn't have, a whole, didn't have, I don't think Providence Farm was there. Um, you know, we didn't have the, again, this whole build out on the side of town. Northbrook wasn't completely built out. Symphony Village wasn't completely built out. So we're talking about a really significant increase of loads on essentially the 213 artery. And, and then secondarily, I think there was more conversation about you know, what Chesterfield Avenue looks like during certain times of the day. And we also have had a pretty significant turnover of residents that live on Chesterfield um, that didn't have an opportunity to weigh in when the TND language was either recommended in the 2009 comp plan or when it was being developed. Um, so you do have a change in trends and that's part of why we are uh, tasked with updating these plans every 10 years. Um, just like we have 
a whole new set of <laughs> seated town council members, and now there's five of you instead of three. And I don't think any of us were, well, I was the only one that was here for the creation of the TND. Um, I was here. Oh, okay, there you go. Have, have we been around that long? Okay. Um, yeah, so it just, I, as we were looking at sort of the aggregate of, of everything, uh, I think it was more about really trying to consider or account for less density on that side of town. But the plan before, the plan before the council, and, and I, I, I'll say, I don't, I don't consider Carter Farm in process. Um, there may be some agreement up, uh, disagreement on that up here. I don't sort of consider the, the, them in process, but I, I go back to the last site plan that we saw that, that we considered, that you all considered, is the density is really close to the R1 density. It yes. seems like the only thing now that we're taking away is the flexibility that that, you know, we, we, come, we all sit up here and say, we don't want any more developments like Northbrook, that sort of cookie cutter, your flavor, hand. right? We all say that we agree with that. Everybody agrees with that. I think. Careful, we've got a Northbrook resident. And yet, and it's actually. not nothing personal. You just, you know, <laughs> nothing personal. Um, I believe that Providence Farm is an R one too, though, we, isn't it? We look. Is it? And I live there, and I don't want any more neighborhoods like that either. So, so <laughs> is there? Is, is, the heights is kind of cookie cutter. Is there a way? Touche. All right. Um, yes. Is there a way to? Well, the other part that protect is, protect the density that that mm -hmm. is that mm -hmm. is on the site plan and also still provide the flexibility. Is that the role the PUD yes. can play? Uh, uh, that's, that's the role that, as I see it. Um, okay. The fact that, you know, w wherever the uh, proposed Carter Farm is or was isn't necessarily relevant to what we're trying to do with the PUD, um, you know, we're, we're not we're not making these changes or making these plans based on something that may or may not happen within the next one to three years, depending on X, Y, or Z. Um, the, we're talking about long-term goals and what's best for the town at large. Um, and if we're gonna start speaking to that Carter Farm parcel, we also had a lot of people that came forward and said, well, wait a second, do we want that kind of density that close to the water? Is, this, is there a better way to do this? Why, wait, what, what is a growth allocation? Why are we why are we giving up acreage inside of a growth allocation if it's that precious of a commodity to us? Should we should we make it less than three units per acre and have it really be part of the you know adjacent property? For instance, is now I think it's eventually going to be you know it was ten acres and it's going to be divided into something like one six acre parcel and another four acre parcel and then you've got the well, what was the old Valiant. Um, um, farmhouse, and that's, I don't know, maybe an acre and a half or two acres. So there is precedent for some larger parcels on that end of town. All of that was, all of that is, are things that had come up, uh, you know, in, in feedback from the citizens when, when we had all these conversations about Carter Farm, and then again, all these conversations that we've had over, I don't know, how long have you been talking about this TND PUD thing? So, so to, it yeah. seems to me like the problem that this is exposed is that we've got at least two residential zones that nobody likes, that nobody wants to see replicated. What are those? R1 and R2. And so... R2? I think so. Yeah, I think so. That would be the smaller... We don't the have 000. very many. How much of it? We don't have very much of it, 30 total. But let's just say... The standardization, you know, sorry to interrupt, but the mm -hmm. standardization is the issue. Right. Whereas right. the TND gives us flexibility. It seems like a, a more straightforward approach to get where we want to go is leave the TND zoning in place, but maybe tweak the numbers and the and what's required of TND, but still have it as a TND development. And that's, that's I'm sorry to interrupt. Head you. Head no. I mean, I just think our underlying zones are problematic, right? They don't reflect kind of what we all agree that we want to see, which is that, uh, uh, a, you know, a range of housing densities, types, and sizes, uh, and and neighborhoods unique to Centerville. You know, I don't think we get to those goals by falling back on these residential zones. So I think there's a lot more work to do in terms of the zoning ordinance we're going to have to pass an update here mm -hmm. to get this stuff where we want to go. Right. 
And I think, you know, I, I'm concerned, I'll sit up here and say that I'm concerned that, you know, the PUD is an imperfect tool for sure. I also and agree. And I think, uh, you know, it was expressed pretty clearly in my opinion that the PUD is too flexible. And I think it, uh, you, you know, sort of keep an open mind but not so open your brain falls out. You know, I think there is a need to sort of revisit the PUD uh, and strengthen it so that it's at least got some standard, mm -hmm. right? It's not just completely open-ended and subject to the whims of whatever developer comes in whenever they come in. If I might comment. So first, I just want to say thank you for the entire planning commissions. It's obvious there's tremendous work that went into this and our council president, of course, is a liaison, um, the town staff, just tremendous work. Just wanted to highlight two things that are particularly important to me. The historic district, all in favor of that. Um, the housing diversity, I don't want to get on a big soapbox here. We're going late, but mm -hmm. it bothers me that after moving home from many years of being away and in the Air Force, that when I would run into folks that work at the grocery store who I worked with when I had my first job at 14, and I said, hey, where are you living now? Oh, I still live in Caroline County. Can't afford to live in Centerville bothers the heck out of me. So I know I'm not alone in that assessment. Um, I, I've read the plan. I'm in favor of it, all except for I, I can't uh, support the, the TND elimination um, and the conversion to, to R1. So that's my only caveat. I feel the same way and, and just echo every, everything that you said, Councilmember Johnson. You know, a lot of the, not to beat a dead horse about GTI, but a lot of the conversation that I had with residents concerned about GTI was they didn't feel that an adequate number of the employees lived here. There wasn't enough skin mm -hmm. in the game because they don't live here. And that, you know, my, my question there is where is it you would have them live? <laughs> because there are not units to rent. And even in the plan, um, and I've read it a couple of times, but it's late, um, in the plan where you guys talk about the Willows, the Willows is not a low income housing development. It's a mixed income housing development. For, for the it, for the the definition of it, it is considered part of it because it's um, it receives uh, you know it, yes. state funding. So that's why it's included. Yeah. Yes, and I and I think it would be fair to put in the plan that it is a partial low income, or as they define themselves, a mixed income community. I just say that to say there are market mm -hmm. rented market rate rented units yes. in there. So yes, I think we are. have not only an adequate diversity of housing types and ability for someone who's maybe middle income, not quite eligible for housing voucher, but, but not quite able to buy a home in Northbrook or Providence Farm, or certainly the historic district, mm -hmm. we're like losing the middle there. And I, and I think that's where employees of a lot of our employers fall, is unable, unable to get into something like the rent fixed spots in the Willows, but also unable to purchase. And so I would not like to see the plan eliminate the TND and take away the, the creativity of some smaller houses and some different housing types that we could have. And I think um, there are probably other tools in the toolbox to get at what we expect out of Carter Farm. And I just, I agree that technically Carter Farm is not in process. Like that, I think, yeah, we could probably all agree on. But um, last year we got a unanimous approval unanimous recommendation from the planning commission to move carter farm forward and then that's actually not accurate Th that's that's we can get into what that actually we is not receive a favorable recommendation from the planning commission? with conditions yes and then we it's it wasn't a favorable okay so if, are we talking about the growth allocation or the conditional approval for the pud because the better way to to put that is that what the, the role of the Planning Commission, unfortunately, in both of those circumstances, because of the PUD specifically and the growth allocation, is that our responsibility was to ensure that the checklist that is in the zoning code was checked off. There was no other, uh, other than the five points that we politely recommended, you know, t for you guys to, for, for the council to consider, there was never actually a weigh in on truly what any of us thought okay so but the role so, of the planning commission and the result of that role it was resulted not, in a favorable recommendation with some conditions i mean that's just the facts i mean that's just absolutely it, the it facts. wasn't if it wasn't a favorable recommendation it was that's not my recollection <laughs> i don't know we talk about the growth allocation or the pud we're, we can get into i i can okay in, in one of the presentations it was actually the, the minutes and, and what our town planner forwarded to the town council for review was not an accurate motion that was forwarded to you. So it, we can, it's, it's, 
It's okay, a back to my, important back part, to my but point. Go ahead. Carter, Carter Farm had legs, and it was it was running through the council, and only because of water and sewer allocation did things sort of come to a grinding halt, or primarily because of, we spent many, many, many meetings negotiating minutia right. about trails and kayak launches and everything you could imagine. And so, to me, someone who was supportive of the project and the creative housing types, everything in this town has a little bit come to a halt because of the water and sewer plant. And so just because we don't have the ability to have that in the pipeline, this still feels like cutting a developer who continues to make an effort to, to do something with Centerville, which, man, I don't know that I still would, the way they've just been yanked every which way. I, I think it's crazy to downzone them. And so that's the, that's the one, minus some changes like the definition of the willows, you know, very minutia stuff mm -hmm. that's not a big deal. Um, that's just the one thing I would like to see not done in this community plan. Here, here. I would be 100% in support of that if it was a process to where you wanted to send that back to us. <laughs> the, the, the TND zoning ordinance. I think that's certainly going to happen. I, I just uh, want to, oh, I'm oh, sorry, go, go ahead. Okay. Yeah. I also have issues with the um, down zoning of the TND, but I also have issues with the elimination of the, uh, well, the reduction of the growth area on the east side. Um, there's, uh, if you, if we don't, you know, we don't annex the property, we do lose control over it. As much as what you would like it to remain farmland, it becomes under county zoning, um, which it currently is anyway. But so their only option is if they want to build housing is to build housing according to the county's code. Um, we also, your transportation, actually the future roadmap shows roads going through the, those properties and they mm -hmm. would, you know, you'd have to work out something with the county this isn't their comprehensive plan. This is the town's comprehensive plan. Those properties would not be in the, um, it, within the town limits. It, um, so I don't know. Whatever your vision might be is kind of on hold. Also, kind of like the idea of having the trail system go through the greenway, and that would not be possible um, unless county agrees to it, it or includes that in their zoning regulations or. Oh. They, in their comprehensive plan, the trail, it's not in there. The trail now so. would uh, follows the border of the amended growth out the the amended border of the growth allocation. It does. The part that was taken out was. <coughs> yeah, you took these two properties out, right? Which is the, the yeah part of it's right here. It's also here, so. I'd like to see those stay in myself because I think there is infrastructure in place, both in terms of state highway. Um, we probably have, I don't know, I might ask the town manager, but I think we probably have uh, water sewer infrastructure there that's oversized that was serving Symphony Village. I don't know that, but um, you know, it just seems like that is an area where we should retain the option to see where the market goes. And I, I completely understand going east out 304 um, towards the new new highway that I'm not going to argue with that but I just hate to de-emphasize an area um, where the market might let's go prefer to go let's go back since we're talking about that let's go back to that when we have a side by side yeah. okay I know you referred to it as uh, servicing um, the smaller state highway, but it also fronts on 213 across from the business park and the retail centers. Correct. Yeah, the the revision to the boundary would go behind that community that's across from, uh, I guess, on the other side of Corsival. I can't remember the name of it. Um, right. Uh, so it would go to the back side of that and then pretty much go run south on 213 across to Symphony Village. I, I appreciate the fact that you had a vision for what you wanted to see there as an entry point, but um, to the points made by other council members, mm -hmm. if we don't have it in our growth area, we kind of give up a voice in what happens there. One of our other concerns was, uh, and again, I'm trying to look this over there, um, that growth area four, um, the, 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 
town planner had proposed part of that to become commercial and, uh, and had sort of reworked that. And that's sort of what I think began the conversation is, well, do we want that to be commercial or are we gonna be competing against, is this, would that be competing against the, the business park across the street and why is that there? And then it turned into, well, what's the advantage of having that parcel out there if um, you know, we've already got infill development that's happening adjacent, that's that orange that you're looking at um, right next to Symphony Village. So, um, or is, is the intention that that would that should go back in as a as residential? Just kind of getting a yeah, so uh, yes, uh, residential, okay. yeah, right? That's not right. That's there's not a we haven't voted on that. Okay, all right. Uh, but okay. <laughs> that's my thought. That's, I mean, I, okay. two, two, two people for sure. Yeah, uh, I'm just gonna sort of. There's a section here and here called alternative growth projections, mm -hmm. which speculates on three growth projection scenarios, growth projections one and three. Number one sort of comprises what I would call consistent growth, where we stay about 9.9, 10% of the county's population. And number three, which I would call kind of modest growth, mimicking the last uh, 10 years or so. Both of those projections, there's also a wildly speculative projection number two, which uh, sees us grow, I think, you know, sort of off the charts. So both one and three, which I think are the most reasonable things, uh, b both include fewer units than currently zoned infill. There are <coughs> 874 potential new housing units in this plan, in the current town, require no annexation. 874 additional units. Growth projections number one and three have fewer than those, than those 874. And projection number one, which is kind of we stay 10% of the county's population, has almost nearly half that many houses. So if we stay 10%, about 400 <coughs> houses. And that's through 2040. 2040. This plan doesn't carry us that far. None of our critical infrastructure, from schools to wastewater and drinking water, can accommodate the highest growth projections of this plan. Indeed, our ongoing plant expansion does not even contemplate enough capacity to meet the most aggressive projections in this plan, which means that a scant 15 years from now, maybe not even that long from now, after we spend upwards of $30 million to build a new wastewater plant, future town decision makers will sit back in these seats in the exact same place we find ourselves today, trying to find $30 million to build a new wastewater treatment plant. It's in the document. Every single growth projection is over a million gallons per day in wastewater. Every single, one, two, and three. All require more wastewater than we are currently contemplating adding right now. Phase one, correct? Uh, a million, I mean a million gallons. We're going to a million gallons, that's the, that's the theory here. And that's been the high number of the discussions. For sure. Mm -hmm. So I believe strongly that this plan has to work to control growth to within the capacity horizons of all the expansions now on the table. This makes no sense to have a 10 year or 20 year speculation in a, in a comprehensive plan that would use up all of our new wastewater capacity. Uh, and then when you consider an as yet unannexed growth area mm -hmm. of 1,835 acres, 1,835 acres there's going to be more with the additional growth area. <laughs> right, if, we, if, if that vote carries to yeah. add number four and number nine back in down there in the southwest mm -hmm. corner, right. that'll go up. It's plain to me at least to see that the plan before the council easily outruns our infrastructure and violates the very essence of smart planning. And you know I care enough because I wrote it down before I said it. I never you can did. tell. <laughs> I mean, I think I'll stop. So... What is your suggestion? Um, what, what that comes down to is density. Uh, There's, right? It, I, I guess it does. I think uh, in some places I'd like to see more density. Mm -hmm. And this is not a popular opinion. Um, in, in some of these places I would like to see more dense growth because the way we protect what we all love about this community more broadly is by growth in the towns close to the infrastructure. But we've got to be wise enough to say the town is about to spend 25 to $30 million to go to a million gallons per day. Let's not plan 
1.2 million dollars worth of worth worth of capacity. So I so I think it's it's for me it's it's the flexibility is essential and we can't have you know Mitchell made a good point about protecting the downtown and what we see all across the the country is that we all love these downtowns. We love them. We put pictures up of Old Town Alexandria. And I would live there if I could afford to live there because it's spectacular, right? But <laughs> And then we make it so you can't build that stuff anywhere else. We make it so you can't, you know, if you tried to build the downtown of this town, the place that we're trying to protect and support and grow, if you wanted to build that again today, you couldn't, you couldn't build it. And so I want to protect the flexibility, but also put some sideboards on, as we've talked about for sure, uh, to get the kind of development we want to see that puts commercial uh, underneath of residential, mixed in with residential. Uh, we've got to decide, I think, I think the question before this committee in some ways is, uh, do we want to see commercial at Carter Farm? You know, that is a question that cannot be avoided. I think we're, uh, if the answer to that is no, we ought to answer that question and let the developers know. This council is currently constructed, doesn't want to see commercial at Carter Farm. You know, I'm not sure what the solution is other than um, I don't think we can afford to have a plan that has quite this much projected development. It's good that the, the number has to come down. I don't think we do that strictly through down zoning. And I will say, you know, I don't think that Turpin Farm currently speculates 290 total units. They could. It, technically, it could do far more, but yeah. the, the, the geographic. Let me finish. Sorry. The geographic footprint won't support right, that right. much. What, what it is zoned at, it can't be supported geographically. You can't put 750 units in there. I think I was talking to a professional planner last week about this plan, and you know we were talking about legal takings. You know, does the downzoning of a property mean it's it's been it's a, it's a taking, a legal taking of the property right? And his response was something I hadn't thought about before: was that the taking almost more uh, manifests itself if you zone it three per or five per acre but you know you're never going to give them that you know it's it's never going to get there you're never going to approve that site plan so let's i think have some workshops with the council and the planning commission to figure out you know what are we going to give people right when it comes to these site plans and zone accordingly you know in some ways with that flexibility built in to get the kind of development we all want to see I'm all over the place, I know, but. My apologies for snapping. Okay. Personally, I'm all for, if, if it were up to me a, a year and a half ago, I would have said, I, I said I do not agree with the use of the PUD uh, as an as a overall planning tool. That if it were up to me, I would put the TND, I would use that as the pattern that we want. The language already exists. Right, so if what we want to do is say, you know, at these different places that might be, all, all that might be is with the TND, for instance, the way it's written, um, you have a, a, you know, only 50% 50, 50 would have to be single family, uh, single family, and then you have another 25% of that, of, of your aggregate houses, right? So say 100 houses, 50 of them would have to be single family. And then another 25 could be townhouse, and then the next 25% could be multifamily. So that 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 density can be played with. And honestly, I mean, the, to go back to the proposal, they were under three units per acre with what we were what what they were giving us. So so to play around with those density numbers, three units per acre isn't. I, I personally don't think that in that in the on the Carter Farm, you know. It being at, at one point in time in R1 until we changed it to uh, the, t the 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 five units or the TND with a five units per acre. Um, every project that we've seen has been less than three units per acre. So, you know. I mean, I think we need a wastewater allocation policy. Mm -hmm. We need a wastewater allocation policy that says, you know, rather than first in line, first in time. If you apply for them and we got them, we'll give them to you. We'll sell them to you. Let's say, actually, we're going to sell them to you if you're doing what we want, right? If, if, your, if your site plan meets the needs of this community, 
you'll get them. And so that might mean that commercial steps in front of residential in some cases or vice versa. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, continuing to have this kind of open door policy on wastewater allocations, to me, the reason why we're here is because we're losing soon enough, I think, this pretty convenient excuse to say no to development, right, which is a wastewater plant. And there's going to be this sort of cresting wave of development where Turpin Farm especially, I think, where it's by right. There's no growth allocation required. There's no critical area component. And so if they come in and meet all the, you know, check all the boxes of that zone, that R3 zone, it's game on, right? And so I think how do we develop an allocation policy and in include the need for that in this comprehensive plan that says we're going to guard this resource that cost us so much money mm -hmm. right. so that the town's not sitting here and, and future councils aren't sitting here in the same place? Well... And, and another suggestion that we haven't really played with, but now that it's being brought up and the concern about actually actually accounting for and encouraging uh, affordable housing is the, I, I, the town council can determine or can can say we want to put an emphasis on uh, you know primary allocations going to those infill parcels that are going to be higher density and provide us a, a higher number off the bat of affordable housing. You know, that's, that's, you know, these are all tools that we can use. It's, you know, it's just writing it into the language. And obviously, if any of you have read the 2009 comp plan, th even the way that it reads is very different. So yes. this one's really data heavy and data driven. Um, one of the things that I, um, that I don't like about this is, is that the, that, well, I was always of the opinion that, you know, the first, uh, the numbers that are, that are used moving forward into those projections are numbers as the infill sits right now. Yes. So if we were to say, okay, let's rethink this. And if we were going to propose that, well, this parcel here can, can support eight units per acre, or we want to down zone or, you know, change the, the infill to three over here. And then what is that number? And then we take that number and move it into, move it forward into projections. And to me, that's much more realistic. Like, you know, if we're saying worst case scenario, great, but it also doesn't give us another alternative. Best like, case scenario, right. right. Yeah. And I think that was something that we talked about and then it kind of just, you know, <laughs> got stuck in the weeds with the TND. I think it was supposed to, yeah, well, and I think it was supposed to be added to the end of a chapter, and then it fell, I mean, you've been to those meetings. I have. There's been a lot. So I'm curious what the, Sharon, I'm going to turn to you. What's a great process here that we could maybe outline tonight where the, the council can sit down with the planning commission and make changes to this document? Is that a? Yes, yeah, so you have four options. You can approve as is modify yourselves, remand it back, or disapprove. <laughs> um, and it sounds like you're thinking about involving the planning commission in your modification process. So, so having some type of workshop to do that, and I think that's perfectly appropriate okay. within what you can do. Okay. That that's the most good optimistic of those options. <laughs> and I would say if, yeah. if there's a list of action items that you would like to task us with so we can maybe sort of work on that, um, means there's, we're, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be back to work sessions. Sorry. <laughs> well, we'll maybe involve the council in some of those. That would be great. Um, is that, do we have consensus to move forward that way? Any of the questions? Yes. I don't, I'm not trying to. Mm -hmm. No, I'm we're good. We're just getting late. It's really yeah, I, I know. Well, yeah, it is. Good. All right. We'll, we'll, we'll have uh, some workshops. Okay. Workshop, at least one. Oh, I know that that's not true. <laughs> okay. yeah. Thank you very no much. Any other questions? One. Thank you I, one last comment that um, a few of us next month are going to a three day oh. planning commission workshop. Um, the state of Maryland planning. Maryland Department of Planning. Right. Maryland Department of Planning is having their annual uh, conference um, on Kent Island. And so thank you in the town for the support to. Yeah to send some of us and we hope to learn stuff and bring it back into these workshops. So I think uh, myself, Mitchell and Pat are gonna, I'm going. oh, and Nancy, Nancy. great. So, awesome. And, and I also just like put out there before we, <laughs> we just real quick that the amount of work that all of us have done as a volunteer, this has been, it's, 
it really has been a, a positive experience, and I think that you know, even though we haven't all been on the same page, but I feel like we have this camaraderie now that <laughs> it's great that after all these meetings we walk out and we're laughing and smiling, and you know, and it, so if if we're not done yet, that's not the worst thing that can happen. I think that at least I can say that I would rather have this done right and not fast. So whatever time we need, I'm willing to put in the time and I hope. I agree, yeah. I hope we've got. Thank you very much. And thank you all for your service on the Planning Commission. Yes. I know it's not easy and we really appreciate you. <laughs> and we will move expeditiously, maybe not quickly because some of our funding sources for the water plant do depend on getting this done. Yes. So. Uh, we'll note that for that's moment. actually a really good point. Um, I think that at some point we had a conversation informally with uh, uh, the town manager and the town attorney about whether or not we could pull some of these chapters out to submit to the uh, to the state. Uh, we weren't sure really what they were asking for, and I think that that we were going to see how fast we could pull this together. But now, if we're getting sent back to the to the drawing to, to half of the drawing board, um, that might be something that is worth discussing and figuring out. Are there things that we could pull out? Or if it's talking about changes in the forecast, you know, then and if and if we want to make that cohesive with what our max is, then that probably is going to be a little bit of a. And if, if I could suggest, I think that's the top of the the list for our workshop would be, and and have it disseminated ahead of time, a checklist of all the elements of the comp plan as it's currently written, so we could see where we do have a majority consensus, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then if there is that opportunity to say, okay, 90% of it was all good and that can be approved in part, I don't know what procedurally is possible, but I think that would help because I think there's some uh, consensus up here around the majority of the plan actually being mm -hmm. fine as is. That's just the sense I'm getting, so. And there might be some uh, tweaks that if we change, you know, chapter of municipal growth, it's gonna change some math over here. So that might get a little, you know, sure. it just, Page Understood. by page, just like we've been doing. So <laughs> we'll figure Thank it out. Thank you all. So we're modifying, not remanding, just to be clear. I think that's what you wanted to retain yep. and, and yep. participate yes. in that process. Yep. Right. Yes. Okay. Thank you all very much. Our pleasure. <coughs> we are going to um, move forward to Ordinance 06 2023. Uh, I'm going to ask for unanimous consent to withdraw Ordinance 6 2023. Yes. Yes. Okay. Sure. Right, thank you. <laughs> Can we quickly do paid family medical leave insurance program? <laughs> the moment you've been waiting for. Absolutely. I will try and be as brief as possible. Um, oh, Chip, I know you were on here. Go for it. Okay. All right. Um, good evening. <laughs> so, um, in your packets, you do have uh, my memo uh, along with attachments. Um, I just want to briefly provide you uh, an overview of the paid family medical leave program in the state of Maryland. Um, it was enacted in September 2021 and is in the process of implementation for an effective date of sometime in 2026. Um, the, the memo was basically just to provide you with an outline of the key features of the program, uh, its benefits and its impact on both the employees and the employer. Literally September 8th is when I saw the webinar uh, from Bolton regarding um, this uh, upcoming state mandate. Um, it, it is definitely a benefit for employees um, and it is going to go alongside of the federal law for the family medical leave. It's very similar to the family medical leave. Um, <clears throat> one of the key features is that um, employees in Maryland are eligible for PFML, um, paid family medical leave, if they work for employers with 15 or more employees. So it's a little bit different than the federal law, which is you know 50 or more. Um, it will cover both part-time and full-time who meet certain criteria. Um, the main types of leave that this will allow is, you know, medical leave, um, allowing employees to take time off for their own serious health conditions, family leave, safe leave, um, 
the benefit amount. Uh, so the program offers partial wage replacement uh, during the leave period up to a certain maximum weekly benefit. Um, the, I'm not going through the whole memo, just you know, to kind of briefly overview it. Um, some of the challenges with regards to the new upcoming state uh, administered plan is um, the town may face administrative challenges in implementing the program. Um, for example, employees uh, who have worked a minimum of 680 hours, which includes current and previous Maryland employers, um, are considered eligible to receive benefits. Um, a lot of other HR directors and I have been questioning how are we going to track this because employees, we know how many hours they worked for us. How, are, how is the state going to be able to supply that information for us, for the employ you know, previous Maryland employers? Uh, so there's a lot of questions. Um, we don't have all the answers as of yet. Uh, the other con challenge is that employers electing to use the state mandated plan will be required to contribute in, uh, employer and employee will have to pre-fund contributions um, beginning October 1st of 2023, which is approximately 15 months prior to the effective implementation date of 2026. Um, so the, the specific cost of the premium rates is unknown at this time. The Secretary of State has not yet released uh, what the uh, contribution rates will be, but it will, uh, the employers are required to contribute at least 50% um, of the premium. Um, we, when I say we, a lot of the HR uh, directors and other municipalities have been um, communicating um, and learning that MML has been in communication with MAKO and MABE to partner and create an alternative to the state plan that is one of those options that employers can uh, join an alternate plan that, you know, if they use a private uh, administration um, service, they would not have to pre-fund contributions. So, as I said, included in this memo, there is an opportunity offered through MML uh, it was dated September 13th. Uh, we did not receive some of these emails until the 20th. <laughs> I even received one today. Um, presenting members with an alternate alternative to the state plan. Um, this col uh, local government collaborative can reduce staff administration, uh, staff administrative burden and de decrease the impact of the town's budget because of the unknown premium cost and what we will have to pre-fund, um, we're just not aware of what this could impact on the town's budget. So what MML has proposed um, as a, another avenue for local governments is to join the collaborative. Um, there's a uh, initial fee and for employees that are under you know, 200 employees, it would be a $3,000 fee. Um, this is a very short notice, time sensitive uh, request for council's approval because the deadline to submit our intent to join this collaborative is September 29th. Um, just because the October 1st uh, date is when pre-funding will begin uh, for state administered plan. And we, we have to provide the coverage. Correct. The, the question is, do we go with the state's plan, which we don't know the cost of? Correct. We don't know the cost of it. Now, in the, uh, let's see. Or, or we go with the MML plan. Correct. Which is $3,000 times however many employees we have that are eligible for this, how many would that be? No, right, we're just paying $3,000 to, oh, okay. to join. We're just paying 3000 to join. Correct. Not, I, I, right, and, and in the, and actually included in this, where is it? Um, I found it under the statement of intent to join. It does actually state in here that, um, where is it? 
I saw in here where it does actually state that um, when the premium rates do come out from the Secretary of State, the this collaborative will not be more than what those premiums will be. So it's, the question before us is three grand to have two options or, or no money to only have one option and we just take the hits as they come from the state. Exactly. Okay. I, and I did put my, my recommendation <laughs> to council uh, that we do join the collaborative. It seems very similar to our health co-op that we uh, have currently with Legit. And I think it would help a lot of these local governments that employ only 15 or more employees that will be required to pay these premiums. Um, I make a motion to approve the town elect to participate in the Time to Care Act Insurance Collaborative and pay fees as outlined in the memorandum of agreement presented by the Maryland Municipal League in response to the upcoming implementation of the state's paid family and medical leave insurance program. Second. Jinx. We have a second and a third. Any discussion? <laughs> <laughs> it's a race. Give that to Councilperson Worth? Uh, uh, yes. Councilperson Kaiser? Yes. Yes? Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you for staying so late. Firehouse Sub Foundation grant request. So in our existing mm. budget, the uh, we had the uh, approval, council approved uh, for money, $10,000 roughly for body armor. We have identified a grant that can cover that cost for us up to $35,000. They used to do just between 15 it's and- It's 10.05 and we all have this in advance of the meeting and can read. So okay. I make a motion to approve the submittal of a grant to the Firehouse Sub Foundation mission for the purpose of purchasing body armor for the Centerville Police Department as previously approved in the budget. Second. Any discussion? Let's get to that. All those in favor, aye. 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 Opposed? Correspondence? Um, there is one flyer that you have in your packet that was um, brought into town hall for the council, walk to defeat ALS um, Chesapeake Bay <laughs> on October 22nd. That's it. Thank you Thank very you. much. Okay, uh, is there any reports of boards and commissions that folks want to provide? The Planning Commission presented tonight, so I'm not sure that we need to get back into that. Uh, MML? Nothing to report. Council of Governments? No report. Economic Development? I'm going to table mine to next time. Park Advisory Board? The only thing I'll say is that we had the fishing derby. There were 53 um, kids that fished. It was a lot of fun, and we will be presenting trophies to the winners at a later meeting. Let's keep the reports of department heads to the town manager and brief as possible. I'm going to cut out some things that still have some maturing going on. Uh, a couple speed humps. We are working with Traffic Logic. We've got some numbers from them. We didn't get any bids on our on our request. It, it was too small a project for somebody to gin up and do asphalt. So working through that to get that done, um, wastewater treatment plant, the new PER, we're doing a parallel review by us and, and MDE. We're expecting that end of October into November. Uh, we are working with uh, WRA to complete the design proposal for an MBR by early October, which will include contract documents for ENR upgrade and expansion uh, to 1 million gallons per day. There are some details I could go through on discharge that we're still exploring, but I'm not going to dive into that tonight. Uh, MDOT, uh, the rail banking, we've had meetings with them on the rail banking to acquire that, that parcel for a trail. As you may recall, that we were looking at that, that option and all the comps came back as really developable property and that wasn't workable for us but with rail banking we would be able to get trail access and even easements for running utilities out in the direction of growth per the plan um, and MDOT is preparing all those documents for you once I get those for your review I'll pass them on to you and I'll leave it at that for tonight thank you very much citizens forum Joe, you ought to say something. You hung in all this time. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on, too? <laughs> Council. <laughs> that sounded like a motion to adjourn. Uh, Council Roundtable. Councilman Beachman. Nothing. Councilperson Worth. I'll pass. Councilperson <laughs> Johnson. Mine's going to be very brief. That's why these folks are here. Uh, we're all running late here, and we're eager to get out of here, but let's end on a real positive note. YMCA has milestones to celebrate. The slide's up for folks at home and in the room. This is what's going on. Awesome things. 
if you could just very quickly come up and just highlight my understanding from somebody that came in earlier was that there might be a date change on this mm -hmm. that was late breaking if that's true i think we would all be very eager to hear that Yes, uh, so I'm Brian Burns. I'm the executive director. Um, this is uh, Laura Feller. She's my membership and wellness director. Um, so yes, we were originally planning on opening um, the 2nd of October, um, but with the weather, incoming weather and, and some um, outdoor like landscaping and paving um, things that will be uh, at, you know, not be able to be done because of the weather, um, we're going to push it back to the 9th. Um, the slide so. is current for anybody at home that's watching this on TV, et cetera. October it's 9th is actually, correct. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Yep. And then the member open house? Will be that, that weekend before. So that's weekend the, before. Yeah, mm -hmm. the 7th and the 8th. Vice, is that set up good? That's it. Thank you. I know you guys waited a long it's time. It's fine. Meeting. This was great. Um, and so, <laughs> if you, uh, um, there it's, never wrote it yet. <laughs> um, and I, we also want to invite you guys as the council if you want to take a tour. Um, just let me know. Yes. Uh, we'd love to Thank walk you. you guys around the facility and let y'all check it out before it gets, you know, crazy over there. So, I'm a member. I'll be awesome. there. Awesome. Very good. You know. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, Vice Thank President Kaz. Thank yeah. you. Have a good I have evening. nothing. Open house the first of the fourth. <clears throat> the open house. It's actually the 14th. Yeah. Huh? Just a formatting error there. Formatting. Yeah, formatting error there. Okay. The 14th. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm, I'm going to just say one thing real quickly. I'd like to get council's consensus. I think we need to reallocate some money in the budget to improve security at our town hall. Uh, I think I'd like to see uh, you know the kind of coded entry or buzzed entry uh, into the back. Uh, create a real safe, secure vestibule. Uh, I'd like to see some estimates on this to keep our town staff and visitors safe, uh, and and make sure that you know you've got to sort of have a reason to be there to get back behind um, some of our minuscule security measures right now. So, is there a general consensus around that sort of thing? I agree with that entirely. Wholeheartedly. Yes. Yep. Okay. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Thank <laughs> you.